Good evening and welcome to the March 16th meeting of the San Luis Coastal Unified School District Board of Trustees. At this time, we'd like to ask that those in attendance please keep their videos off and audio muted unless they're presenting information or speaking in public comment. We're offering translation services for our Spanish speaking attendees. To ac access translation, please click on the globe at the bottom of your screen and then the language. At this time, we'd like to ask if anyone who needs translation would please click on the participants icon at the bottom of your screen and raise your hand. Buenas tardes a todos y bienvenidos esta tarde a nuestra junta del consejo directivo del día 16 de marzo. Esta junta va a estar siendo interpretada al español. Si necesitan los servicios de interpretación, por favor, en la barra inferior van a ver un globo terráqueo en unos minutos, pero antes les quiero pedir que levanten su mano en la lista de participantes para saber qué necesitan de mis servicios. Una vez que yo termine de hablar, van a activar la función y va a aparecer un, un um, globo en esa barra y lo pueden picar y seleccionar español. Gracias. Great. Thank you very much. Let's move to item 3.02. It looks like all the board members are here. That would be item 3.01. 3.02 is consensus on the order of business. Is everybody good with the order of business? Okay, I'm not seeing Ellen. Um, there we go. Ellen, are you good with that? Okay, perfect. Yes, thank you. Let's move on to item number 3.03, .03, approval of minutes, February 16th, 2021. Would someone like to make a motion on that? So it's been moved by Mrs. Frame and seconded. Oh, second by Mr. Buckman. Hold on, let me just mark this down. Is there any discussion on this? Perfect, okay. Uh, Evelyn. Yes, I'll make, are we voting or am I? I'm yes, making... we're voting. Mark? Yes. Uh, Eve? Yes. Catherine? Yes. Marilyn? Yes. Ellen? Yes. And I'm a yes. Motion passes 7 0. Let's move on to item 3.04 approval of minutes, March 2nd, 2021. Is there any discussion? Oh. Oops, somebody I'll like to make a motion. We have a motion by Marilyn. Would someone like to make a second and second by Eve? Any other discussion on this? Okay, Marilyn? Yes. Eve? Yes. Mark? Yes. Ellen? Yes. Catherine? Yes. Evelyn? Yes. And I'm a yes. Motion passes 7-0. Item number 3.05, approval of minutes, March 11th, 2021. Any comments? Would someone like to make a motion, please? Motion by Mark. I'll second. Uh, Ellen, I'm, I think Ellen was first. Ellen, you wanted a second, right? Okay. Sure. Second by Ellen. Uh, any comments about this discussion? All right. Mark? Yes. Ellen? Yes. Marilyn? Yes. Evelyn? Yes. Catherine? Yes. Eve? Yes. And I'm a yes. Okay, let's move on to item number 4.01, student representatives to the board. Do we have some student representatives to the board today? Yes, okay. hey there. Hey, how's it going? Going well, how about you? Good, are you ready to give us a report? Yes, yeah, that sounds good. Um, so on Friday last week, we actually hosted an orientation for our freshmen and all new students to Familiar, familiarize their, themselves with the campus and uh, find out where their classes are and you know just feel welcomed on campus um, and it went really well so that was super fun and then obviously um, yesterday and today we've had our first day of classes 
from eight in the morning until 11.30. And then the asynchronous um, or the distance learning is in the afternoon. And um, so far it's been super fun. And yeah, we have a spirit day this Thursday um, to get our campus spirited up. Uh, we have a black and gold day. And other than that, just sports are going going on, you know, matches, games are happening and practices are also consistently happening. So it's been a good week. That's all hi. Great. Okay, thank you. Do we have anybody? And of course you're welcome to stay for the meeting, but it looks like you uh, are in your car right now. So uh, I, I doubt if you'll be staying I, in the meeting tonight. <laughs> I actually have work you. right now, yeah, but thank you. Oh, well, good luck and, and good luck as your year goes on. Uh, is there anyone else, Thanks any other student representatives? And I'm not seeing Jennifer, anyone saw, else. Okay. I saw someone named Jennifer pop up on my screen anyway. Okay. No, uh, no. Let's move on to item number 4.02, Morro Bay High School Program Highlights. And Dr. Prater, uh, I'm assuming you will introduce. Um, well, hello, Mr. Unger. Yes, hello. Yeah, hi. Uh, that's uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, Jeff Cudwallader from Morro Bay High School and uh, his team uh, that'll share highlights from uh, what's happening at Morro Bay High. Thank you, Rick, and uh, thank you everybody for having us tonight. Um, my assistant principal, Stephanie, is here as well. Um, so tonight we're highlighting um, our pods and the um, pods that have been going on at the school since uh, October. Um, we've had a lot of success with all of our pods uh, that have been on campus from our phase one phase two special education pods to the ones that we've, we've recently started uh, and we're actually continuing um, having those pods go even though we're back in person um, we have some online pods going with those distance learners in the morning and then we have students coming and staying in the afternoon to continue on and get the extra help they need um, all of our pods have been very successful the students we chose to um, to bring back on campus all the way back in october or students that were struggling, um, failing classes, have Ds, uh, just needed that extra help and we were able to get them their support. Um, a lot of students are, um, have been you know, coming uh, every day, all day to get that extra help. And we're happy to report that almost every single student that has been coming to a pod is no longer failing or has any Ds. They're, they've brought their grades up. Uh, they've actually um, also been able to um, regain some credit that they may have lost from last semester uh, and some students um, are working through apex online and trying to earn credit that they've missed in previous years as well um, so we put it together a little video just so you can see um, <clears throat> what our pods look like and see the students and um, that it's not just school that goes on they're having some fun and it's actually been a lot of fun the last two days having students on campus as well mandy did you want me to play or did you want to go ahead and do that You can go ahead and do it, Jeff. Thanks. All right.
That's uh, an example of what's going on at Mora Bay, or has been going on at Mora Bay since October. Uh, now our classrooms are a lot more full um, with students back on campus. Chris, can I ask a quick question? Yeah, sure. Yes, of course. Go ahead, Mark. So, um, so Jeff, I noticed the guitars and the ukulele behind you, and I noticed the music. <laughs> so I just wondered if that was you playing in the background. Uh, that was not me playing. Ah, too bad. Okay. <laughs> I know. Thanks. Well. Any other questions from the board? I well, see Eve waving. Oh, Eve, did, thank you. Um, Eve, you're muted. I was thinking like Mark was thinking, but then I heard the violin and all that and everything. <laughs> and I thought, well, maybe not. <laughs> well, I just, I just wanted to say to thank, to thank, um, to thank you. I, m my wife and I sponsor a scholarship at Morro Bay High School. And then today I went over to pick up the paperwork on it. And Jeff's, Jeff was kind enough to spend an hour showing me around the campus and letting me see the different classrooms. Um, and just to, to kind of see how it's going. And, and I think it, it's safe to say it's going remarkably well. Um, some of the things I noticed were every single person was wearing a mask all the time. I, di I didn't see one person without a mask. The students were separated to the best of their ability. For the most part, all the desks were six feet apart from each other. Um, there were clear pathways in the classrooms uh, so that the students would only walk one way throughout the classrooms. Um, and then to, to see like Jeff just like jump into the action when one of the teachers needed uh, an amp some amplification in her classroom um, because she had she was going to be outside it, it was the choir teacher and she wanted to make sure she was saving her voice jeff just jumped right in grabbed the the portable pa um you know set it up for her so that she was able to to teach her class um the scheduling that they've got going on there i mean just the, the class scheduling is just pretty amazing what, what you guys are doing there and then i got a chance also to go to the auto shop um go it was very impressive what's going on there um, I think the, the new teacher is, uh, he's going to try to start entering contests and things like that, right, Jeff? So he talked a little bit about Skills USA, possibly. Um, yeah, got he's got Mrs. some Hainer's, big plans. Yeah, got to see Mrs. Hainer's class, the advanced Photoshop class, photo class, um, as well as Liz Moore's class. So just, I got to see a lot, and uh, it was very impressive. And, and again, I just want to thank you for the time that you spent with me today, because um, I know that you're just a really busy super busy guy and um but you guys are making it work and thank you and thanks to your staff too absolutely it was uh, my pleasure uh thanks for coming out today yeah it was really it was super fun all right any other questions from board members okay let's move on to item 5.01 correspondence and the board did receive one one piece of correspondence from shannon hurley regarding high school scheduling so thank you shannon this is part, this will become part of the record of the meeting. Let's move on to public comment. Uh, Dr. Eisendrath Rogers, I believe we have several items of public comment and Dr. Eisendrath Rogers will read them and then um, I'll take care of the uh, verbal ones. Okay, hopefully you can hear me through this mask. Um, Julie Dolls, my name is Julie Dolls. I am a parent educator too and a CSEA member. I work in the prepare vocational slash community based program. My coworker, Shana Bailey, and I 
perform job duties in a two staff to one student capacity. With our staffing, both staff are within one to two feet for the majority of the day due to the behaviors of the student. Our student is non-masked. We provide AM and PM transportation with our student. This involves our faces and bodies to be within inches of his face as we assist with buckling and unbuckling our student. Upon arrival at school, we use the bathroom he needs a variety of prompting, which requires both Shana and I to be within three feet of him in the bathroom. Toileting done at least every hour, some days more often. When he is finished, we assist with hand washing. This is done as we are standing next to him. Again, this is done numerous times daily. Another activity we do at the table is eating. We are helping again hand over hand to make his snack. After eating, he washes his dishes at the sink. He can take longer than 15 minutes to get started. At times, he needs hand over hand assistance. This means that the student, Shana, and I are within three foot, foot radius of each other while at the sink. Our student then washes his table. He is often needs gesticular uh, or hand over hand. We are within two to three feet while cleaning at the table. After snack, we work on vocational skills. We must often work hand over hand to aid our student in working on strengthening his job skills for up to 30 minutes. Some of our jobs are washing dishes, cleaning tables and chairs or windows, shredding and vacuuming. By doing these vocational tasks, some being done hand over hand, we must be physically touching his hands. I believe that the COVID-19 health and safety guidelines established by the district are not sufficient to meet the needs or standards of protection for all paraeducators working in close contact with students, particularly those whose job duties involve toileting, exposure to bodily fluids, or face-to-face -face contact with students within six feet for longer than 15 minutes many of which these students are not wearing nor required to wear face coverings. This places staff members at a higher risk of exposure to COVID-19, thereby increasing the possibility of transmitting the virus among their home environments and to their family members. The next communication is from Amber Wilkerson. Dear San Luis Coastal Board and Dr. Prater, my name is Amber Wilkerson, and I am a special day class teacher in SLC USD. I am proud to have taught in my special education class for over 20 years, six of those here in SLC USD. Our district is by far the most supportive, informed, and consistent district, district I have worked in when it comes to special education services. We put kids first, and I have felt supported as a special education teacher. As educators, we always are reflecting on what we can do better. The board has an opportunity to enhance the lives of an amazing group of people dedicated to this district and the students in it, our special education paraprofessionals. As anyone who works in special education knows, paraprofessionals are not, quote, classroom assistants. They are teachers without credentials. They are our front line, our right hand, and sometimes the guest teacher when a sub is unable to manage. During the time day class came back in person, paraprofessionals earned an additional $7.50 an hour for close contact pay. This has thus ended since all students have returned. I did not understand how impactful $7.50 an hour could be until I listened to the paraprofessionals on my site it became increasingly clear how appreciated and important they felt with this increase in pay. Although the pay has stopped, the close contact has not. It is time we look at the cost of living in slow, the importance of our paraprofessionals, and how $7.50 an hour can affect the district's ability to recruit, hire, and retain the best of the best. I have heard people say that if paras want to make money, they should go back to school. This is not always an option. And I, for one, appreciate the people who are willing to do teacher work for para pay. I could not do my job without the paraprofessionals in my room. 
And the last one is from Dakota Moulton. I am entering my fourth year as a paraeducator in our district, and I have always been impressed and have felt fortunate to be a member of our district. Upon reopening, which occurred as early as October for some of my special education colleagues, we have shown our dedication to our students and classrooms and our district. We took to the task of educating our learners in person despite the pandemic and the bulk of the district remaining virtual. We often hear from teachers and specialists, but not often from paraeducators. We have been in the front lines for many of us. Our jobs do not allow us to maintain many of the COVID safety guidelines. Some paraeducators move between multiple classes. Some work very closely in one-to-one -one environment. Some are in situations where teachers and, or where students cannot wear a mask. My normal day includes the need to often be six feet apart from students who do not or cannot properly put on a mask and include students who have compulsory mouthing. That is, they constantly lick their hands or, or touch their faces, which makes maintaining COVID protocols unlikely, if not impossible. Our positions as paraeducators put us at a higher risk and the protocols do not always align with our duties. The demands of our role have been increased with the school reopening. For example, many of us integrate into multiple general education classrooms during the day, increasing our exposure. I understand our jobs set us apart. I know the language to keep us safe includes phrases such as, quote, to the best of, of our ability. But we need to remember, no matter how much we love and are dedicated to our jobs and students, we are all individuals who would like to keep ourselves and our families safe. Great. And I, that's all the written comments we have. We do have one person who wished to speak on this item. Is Nicole Bittison here? Nicole? Hi, Nicole. You know what? I think you're muted right now. And so the second you unmute yourself, I'll start yeah. your three minutes. There you <laughs> I go. I was waiting to be unmuted, but here I am. Yes, my yes. name is Nicole. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay. Go ahead. That's all right. My name is Nicole Bittison, and I am also a paraeducator in the district and a CSEA member. In my position, I work with students across three school campuses from elementary to high school as well as have worked in a variety of special education environments from the more intense to special day classes to the less intense special day classes and even our um, CEP classes. I would like to first of all thank the board members, uh, the superintendent and department directors in addition to student support services um, for their hard work, vigilance and desire to keep students and staff safe while operating in unique times. I am especially grateful for the push to make sure all staff have access to getting vaccinated as soon as possible. I'm speaking uh, tonight because you've heard a lot from parents, community members, and even teachers about returning to in-person schooling. However, I don't recall hearing anyone in a class five position speaking in this forum. I feel it is important to hear all sides because the schools are made up of more than just students and teachers. It's full of secretaries, custodians, bus drivers, food service workers, instructional aides, and paraeducators all working to make the school environment um, there for students. As a paraeducator, I work directly with students to assist them with their schoolwork, socializing, and meeting their IEP goals. We are often their closest contact besides their friends and family. When special education groups started returning to campuses in September, many parents spent a lot more one-on-one -on -one time with them, uh, with their students. And in many cases, much closer than six feet and longer than 15 minutes, as you have heard uh, uh, read tonight. While this was a voluntary basis, most parents who work in special day classes were excited to be able to see their students in person again including myself. Zoom just wasn't cutting it for these students. Uh, now that we've moved into the hybrid plan, these paras uh, are still working in close contact. And as a result, I believe that the COVID-19 health and safety guidelines 
established by the district are not sufficient to meet the needs or standards of protection for all paraeducators working in close contact with students, particularly those whose job duties involve toileting, exposure to bodily fluids, or face-to-face -face contact with students within six feet for longer than 15 minutes, many of which these students are not wearing required or nor required to wear face coverings. This places these staff members at a higher risk of exposure to thank COVID. You, Nicole, your, thank you, Nicole, your three minutes are yeah. up. Now, let's, I, I do need to read this statement to see if, before we see if there's anyone else who'd like to speak uh, during public comment. The board welcomes comments on matter of district interest. The board will listen, but cannot ex engage in discussion or take action on items not listed in the agenda. Generally, this section of the agenda is for individuals or a representative of a group to address the board on issues not listed on the agenda. Speakers who wish to discuss items on the agenda are requested to wait until that item comes before the board. However, comments may be given on agenda items at this time, if not possible for a speaker to stay until the agenda item is heard by the board. If you submitted written comments on a topic, you won't be allowed to, sub to speak on that topic. Comments or, pub or correspondence submitted anonymously will not be accepted. You can contact us via the public comment request form prior to the meeting or while the meeting is in session. If you wish to speak after I'm done reading this, uh, please click on the participants icon at the bottom of your screen and select raise your hand. When your name is called, you may restart your video if you wish and unmute your audio. If you need assistance with your video, please let us know and we'll attempt to fix it. If you have a problem with your audio, please click on the thumbs down icon and we'll attempt to assist you. All public comments will be limited to three minutes, a limit of approximately 450 words of written comment. Any portion of your comment extending past the 450 word limit may not be read aloud due to time restrictions. All written comments that are not read into the record will be made part of the meeting minutes, provided that such comments are received prior to the end of the meeting. Please be aware that written public comments, including your name, may become public information. Is there anyone else who wishes to address the board at this time? Seeing no one, we'll move on to item number 6.01, business and budget update. Mr. Pinkerton? Yeah, just a quick couple of things for the board. Um, spent the last couple of days going to all the secondary sites and again, I think like Mr. Unger said, we were very pleased at what we saw. It was almost, almost as if we were overprepared, I think, in, in terms of kids coming back and um, just how smooth things went. So, you know, there's always that parking lot crunch at the beginning and, you know, of the day, right, especially the first day before parents kind of pick, figure out kind of where to park and, and where to drop kids off. But, but overall, very smooth, walked around, went through classrooms. Um, and, and was just really pleased. I think all the principals got almost a sigh of relief in talking to them um, as, as we went forward. So that was just a really nice thing to see. Again, kudos to everyone who made that happen, right? So from Kim and the plan to our teachers and our classified staff and our bus drivers and our, our custodians and our ground crews and just everyone, um, you know, made that possible. And, and for me, what seeing those kids smile, just happy to be back was was fantastic. So I'm mean, real positive in terms of that, that feeling tone that you get when you're back on the school site. So I was really pleased with that. Um, food service, feeding, feeding kids, right? So now both in person as well as trying to keep the pantry boxes going. So trying to keep the, you know, that they, they started that service up. It's been a huge help to families. And um, I think through these times, right? So they're doing everything they can to kind of keep both going. But once students came back, K-1-2, they had to feed them in the classroom, right? Both AM and PM. Um, then 3-6, AM and PM. And now with secondary. So starting yesterday, they uh, another, you know, 600 meals a site, right? So just a lot of food going out from that yet also trying to maintain those Friday pantries. So um, after the first week, they quickly realized that they needed to kind of consolidate, bring everything back to the central kitchen, um, which is what they did, right? So I, I want the board to know that they did, Aaron did reach out to the coastal families that were impacted by that decision and talked to them about, 
sharing. So having one family pick up for multiple families. Um, there were, you know, there were families that were impacted and we made sure that those families got their pantry box. Right. So there's things that we did to go, go above and beyond and Aaron and her staff. So um, I was there today. I, I mean, it is, it's pretty unbelievable when you, if you walk through Laguna Middle School and, and the central kitchen there um, in the multi-purpose room, just what they've done over the past year now um, to really assist families. So again, huge kudos to the food service staff. Um, and, and I know Aaron and her team are trying to keep that going for as, as long as possible. So um, just really a positive. The biggest thing at the high schools is the kids will walk by and is, is it really free? And yeah, no, really, you can take you can take a lunch. It's, it's okay, right? So the federal government, fortunately, is subsidizing all meals for kids. So, um, you know, we're hoping that even those daily meals that kids pick up is going to uh, continue. So those are kind of two huge um, positives, and and uh, I'll hand it over to Kim. Thank you, Kim. Um, I, item six point zero two, Ed Services update. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, some of the things I was going to share tonight is exactly what Ryan was saying. Lots of great things happening at the sites, and uh, just you know, as we go around and just see it running so smoothly. So excited to see happy students, etc. So uh, great to see. We've had a lot of changes with athletics. We do have a COVID update as a, a board item today, so I will be happy to share some of those pieces. One of the key pieces that I know was. Um, uh, you know, a lot of people were happy to see was that there was a change to um, the public health guidance around observers at athletic events. So that um, change did happen that we're allowed to have 20% uh, of the capacity of the facility per sport available at the um, athletic site. So imagine a, a water polo deck, the pool deck, 20% um, capacity of that, that we're allowed to have observers there. Of course, that being a really different number than 20% of a football stadium, for example. Um, but good to see that the science is showing us that we can continue to, uh, you know, slowly continue to open and just need really um, people continuing to follow the guidelines, especially around the community um, as we're not finding spreads that tend to happen at school sites it does tend to be what is brought to the school site from um, you know other things that people are engaging in so just that reminder that as we want schools to stay open as long as possible and as few cohorts to close as possible as well as our extracurricular activities uh, the cooperation of everyone um, chipping in to do their part is super helpful for all of us so i'll be happy to share more during the update great uh, any questions from the board Okay, uh, Ryan, uh, measure. I, um, I'm sorry, item 6.03, Measure D update. It's just a couple quick bomb things to update the board. So if you've had a chance to see the 100 building, um, you'll notice some, some big differences there. The main building on campus, classroom building. So the, the entire middle section now has been completely gutted. So you can see all the way through it, uh, both top and bottom. So uh, making good progress on that uh, building. They did put the drywall into the science room. So it, they actually look like classrooms now. So that's the, the southern portion, which is going to be ready for the fall for the science classes and to move over. Um, so definitely positive um, steps that we're making there. And I think just in general with kids back on campus at Slow High, the, the kids appreciate, you know, kind of the, the changes on campus, the way it looks, the feel, right? We're all the way off at the bottom half of, of campus. So that really enhanced, you know, no more dirt trail for kids to get, you know, into the campus and having that new turnaround front entrance. Um, is, is definitely helpful, I think, as we move forward. Um, Mall Bay High right now, they are, they are this week putting together the sidewalk in front of the A building. So the new theater, uh, multi-purpose room space, food service, that um, building is being demoed right now along with the quad area. So that whole middle section of campus, the kids are literally, it's like a U right now going back and forth. So um, by Friday, they're supposed to have the new sidewalk poured in between, so kids will have kind of a circular access to be able to get back and forth um, into those classes. So that is something that will be very helpful, I think, just with the flow of kids being back. So um, there's kind of two, th two key things. Great. Well, thank you very much, Ryan. Any questions or comments from the board? Okay, seeing none, we'll move to item number 7.01. 7.01 is resolution 19, 2021, certifying the second interim report. Uh, and I believe that's back to you, Mr. Pinkerton. 
Yeah, so I'm going to introduce Katie Eklund. She's our new director for fiscal services uh, for the school district. Very, very fortunate to have her, um, you know, leading this, leading us now uh, with Julie Lane's retirement. So she actually put in all the work to get the second enter together. She, she's going to be here to present um, for the board. Uh, just big picture when the board thinks about these these interim budgets, and so. Um, after this presentation, I will be going through the tenure with a little bit more specifics in terms of projections. But the, the key to remember is these budgets and the system software called SACS is set up to show that you spend every penny that you budget, right? So you'll often see at first interim a deficit, at second interim a projected deficit. And what we realize is that by the end of the year, we never spend every single penny in every single category. And so because of that, um, it, it's just something that, you know, the board needs to be cognizant of. And again, unaudited actuals, which come after the, you know, the fiscal year closes out in August, that those are the true numbers, right? That, um, that you know exactly what the expenditures and revenues were for the, for the school district. So, but without any further ado, I'm going to have Katie um, go ahead and, and uh, share. Great. Thank okay. you. Um, Mandy, are you moving the slides forward? I'm actually doing it for you, Katie. Oh, okay. Then can you go to the next slide, Ryan? Okay. Um, so this slide is an overview of the changes from first interim to second interim. Um, as you can see, the beginning balance doesn't change. Our estimated revenues um, changed a little bit, not, um, not too much, about $70,000. Um, the biggest change was with our estimated expenditures. Um, we had a change of roughly $1.8 million in expenditures. Um, the biggest um, increase that we had was we um, contributed an additional $1 million to routine restricted maintenance. And that was for some roofing projects um, that were done during um, the school closures and other maintenance projects that were planned. And then um, another part of the, um, a major part of the increase was for the virtual learning um, program where we added two additional FTEs. Um, so those were the most material changes to um, impact the fund balance. And as Ryan said, this would be assuming we fully expended our um, fund balance at the, or not fund balance, are fully expended our budget as of June 30th. So we have an estimated surplus at first interim of 1.4, which my understanding is a lot of that was carryover. And we have now added about 1.8 million to that, decreasing the ending fund balance by 3.2 million. If you can change to the next slide, thank you. Um, here's some highlights um, on the revenue uh, side of the second interim. And again, this is all new information from November 1st. Uh, you could go back one more, please. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. From November 1st to January 31st. Um, so there was a change from uh, special education property taxes and COE transfers um, that were done. The COE gives us that at P1, which is um, in January and then P2 again in April, which would show up in estimated actuals and the budget when we bring that in June. Uh, the title funds were updated based on the um, current most recent award letters. And then the biggest change was to local revenues and that was due to lowering, there's no parent fees right now due to transportation not occurring. Um, that pretty much sums up any uh, major changes on the revenue side. Next slide. Thank you. So um, this pie chart, I know you all are familiar with, and it highlights that property taxes is 75% of the total income the district brings in. There is a, an increase in federal at 7%, typically I think that would be more at three or 4%, but due to all the CARES and COVID dollars we have received since um, July 1st, it has bumped up the federal revenue and um, a tiny portion of state revenues have increased as well due to CARES. 
And here is a pie chart that represents our expenditures. Um, uh, it says that our salaries are uh, make up 85% of our revenues. But if you were to add up the salaries on the pie chart, I want to clarify that only shows 76%. And so the difference is of our total property tax revenue, which is unrestricted, our total salaries and benefits make up 85% of that. Um, if you were to look at our total budget, including unrestricted and restricted um, grants, our salary and benefits make up 76%. And that's what's represented on this chart is total restricted and unrestricted expenditures. Next slide. Um, this slide is an overview of the benefit projection rates for STRS, PERS, and Health and Welfare. Um, STRS received a um, little bit of relief from the governor's budget for 21. 22, as you can see, those rates are a little bit lower than they were in 1920. But in 22, 23, at this time, they're projected to go back up. And PERS continues to be on an upward swing. The governor does not really have um, any influence over the PERS, CalPERS board. And then with health and welfare, we're projecting a 3% increase, but we'll find out the actual rates tomorrow at our CISC meeting. And we'll know more then. And this final slide represents the difference if the district was funded by LCFF versus property taxes, currently being funded by property taxes. The district is averaging about $11,621 per ADA this year versus if we were fully LCFF um, entitlement and that would be 9,307. Um, the county treasurer's office um, and auditors has um, estimated next year's property taxes to be in the 4% range, but we're on the more conservative side doing three to three and a half percent um, for next year. So we'll have a better idea at P2, which will be released in April, and they'll give us the latest update on property taxes for the upcoming fiscal year at that time. So does anybody have any questions? Uh, let's see, I think Mr. Buckman has questions. Anybody else? And I'll get you in line. That's okay. Okay, Mark. Yeah, Chris, I'm sorry, I didn't, do you want to go to the public first or any, um, any reason? I don't know. You know what, if, if you want to go ahead and ask a question and then I'll come back to the public sure. because it is a it is a resolution. And then I'll, I'll review the 10 year budget after. Okay, got it. Um, Katie, this was just great. And I know we spent some time talking today and I really appreciate that. Um, I'm just gonna, I have one question at this point. Are, are we, are we at the point now where we're deficit spending? That is correct. Okay. At this point, if we were to fully expend our 2021 budget, we would be deficit spending approximately 3.2 million, um, which 1.4 of that, my understanding is, was made up of carryover. And then, like I said, the additional of the 1.8 million of that um, went to the routine repairs and maintenance. And and so, and I heard you before, but just so your projection is that we will, we'll probably, we'll be okay by the time we get to the end of the year. Correct. I don't anticipate we would fully expend our budget. Um, right now with COVID and um, other things that we would normally maybe uh, reduce, maybe be looking at the sub cost and other salary lines. It's just really kind of hard to tell for me being new and with the pods where that's gonna land. So I didn't make a lot of adjustments um, in that particular area where we would maybe be able to scale back, but I don't anticipate that we would fully expend or any positions that were vacated halfway through the year, things of that nature. Thanks, and just, is there a way to, to capture how much COVID money has come in so far? Because I keep reading in the media how much money is going to public education. I just wonder how much is coming to us. Um, absolutely. I think Ryan might touch on this later, but we um, are, it was not reflected in the second interim. We are going to re receive another two, a little over $2 million of COVID funds. And then the um, 
third round of ESSER funds that they're talking about would be close to 5 million. It has certain parameters um, on how that's to be spent. And then before that, the district, I think, received close to, I think it was 3 million or a little over 3 million, three and a half million. So I actually, I think I can answer that. The Ed, Ed Source, so for those of you who aren't familiar, there's a, something called Ed Source. So did you read the Ed Source article? Well, actually, I think it said that we were expected to receive about 12, 12 million, a little more than $12 million, but that's over the two years. Last, yeah, it's, it's, all of the, it's all of the federal stimulus money over last year's and this year. So um, we're, I think it's what, about $1,600 per ADA or something like that, yeah, roughly? Please. Yeah. Great. Thanks. That'll be helpful. I'm sorry, Mark. Okay. Thanks, Katie. Anybody else from the board who would like to ask a question now? Eve. Got it. Um, Got it. Go. <laughs> Before you correct me. Okay. So I wanted to ask if the deficit spending cuts into the reserves or does it go beyond the 10% reserves? It does not cut into the 10% reserve. The district still maintains a 10% reserve. So we're, we're golden. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, Marilyn? Mr. Pinkerton, isn't this pretty typically what we see year after year at the first and second interim that we appear to be deficit spending until we have the, um, the final results and everything that isn't spent falls to the bottom and we find that we have not deficit spent? That would be correct. So that's what I'm going to be going over the 10 year budget, which, which will hopefully give the board a, a much better look at where we project to be at the end of the year. Okay, but we can just, unless you tell us otherwise, we can assume that this is our typical, uh, the typical landscape of our budget as it proceeds through the year. Absolutely. Thank you. This is very normal for a second interim budget. Mark, do you have another question? Yes, and I, and I appreciate Marilyn's comments. And, and while I understand that this is typical, I, I really feel it's important to, to continue to ask. So I apologize. Oh, I, no, it's great. Okay, great. Thanks, and, Ron. You know, just because the board knows that we do a 10-year projection of those types of things, you know, right. new, new members to the public staff who maybe don't go to all the meetings, they're, they're great questions. So before I go to the public, Ryan, why don't you, I think this would be a good time for you to talk about that 10-year budget yeah. projection. Then we'll go to the public. Uh, and then we'll bring it back to the board to see um, if there's a motion to for the resolution. It's a little tough for another board member here, but hopefully everybody in there um, at home can kind of see this. So I'm just going to go through a few years, a few kind of key details through this 10-year budget. So I think it's important. So 1819 was the last year that we had a normal, that I would say, budget. Right? It's a normal revenues, normal expenditures, no COVID, no pandemic that happened. Um, and, and so it, it, was, it was kind of a key year. So when you look at the revenues and expenditures, you'll see some like normal sub costs, normal electric bills, those types of things. So we do know that in 1920, starting in March, school ended for all sakes and purposes. And so a lot of the things that we did towards the end of the year, transportation, um, athletics events, graduations, all of those things did not happen. And so we ended up having a substantial amount of money fall to the bottom line, probably about 2 million. We also have had a very large influx of um, dollars through the Dabble Canyon mitigation settlement, which I'll show you um, really quick. So a difference there. So here we come to 2021 and you'll see some major, like we received you know, $7 million in federal and state funds this year specifically meant for pandemic relief, right? And what did we spend those dollars on? Well, we spent it on um, paying our staff extra for volunteering to be in person. We bought one-to-one -one computers for every single student on, in, in our schools. We have hotspots, right, that we gave out to every single student who needed one to ensure that they could do distance learning. We had childcare that was available to our parents. That, that alone is probably a million dollars um, of those 7 million that, that we've um, set up for this year. We've added counseling services for our students. Um, it, needless to say, there was also all of the PPE supplies that you see in the plexiglass and the masks and the gloves and the disinfectant and all of those things that went into those dollars, um, as well as we have spent 
probably close to two million dollars on HVAC repairs and replacement and ionizers, right? So all of those things to make sure that our classrooms were safe for students to return. So I just wanted to point that out. So that seven million dollars that we received this year is pretty much spent, and we we spent it on those items. Now, fortunately, last week. President Biden signed up, signed a new COVID relief um, legislation. And so we, we will be receiving, it looks like about $5.4 million um, in assistance for next year. That is not reflected in this budget yet, okay? Um, and honestly, I don't necessarily think it's gonna change this budget because we're gonna put it in as revenues and then the board's gonna come, come together with a plan to spend it all next year, kind of like we did with the 7 million that we had this year, right? Things that we don't normally spend uh, money on. And so that's something that uh, will come to the board during LCAP conversations and about what we need to do, you know, led by Kim and Rick and, and um, the curriculum instruction team, right? And our principals and our staff about what we need to do to try to get kids back on track and catch up, um, you know, for the potential learning loss that's happened over the past year. So, so as we just go through this, just a few things I wanna point out, right? As we look through it. So again, uh, property tax revenues. So I'm gonna hit the, the bold lines, the bold numbers. So first, this first page is all revenues, right? This is the dollars we receive as a school district. Hey, Brian, can I interrupt you for a yeah, I just, absolutely. I really want to reiterate that that $7 million you're talking about is one-time money. Is that correct? Absolutely. Okay. And it, and, it, and it has specific parameters on how it can be spent and specific timelines. Is that yes. correct? Yes. Okay, thank you. And so, and again, I should also add, you know, we added a lot of additional staffing. So that's one thing I didn't point out, you know, pod leaders and um, we had some teachers that didn't want to come back in person and so we actually hired more staff to kind of take those roles we we lowered class sizes really early on to make sure that if we did come back in person that we would be able to fit the number of students in each class so a lot of those things um, um, happened now some of those things are one-time funds some are not so oftentimes with staffing, um, you know, we did have some temporary teachers, but hopefully through this process, we'll have enough retirements, we'll have enough, you know, just staff that leave, um, that we, you know, we, we won't have to do any types of layoffs um, is, is always something that we're focused on when we look at budgeting. So, but if you look at that first number there, you know, we've been very fortunate. Our property tax values have increased over the last few years. Um, with the amount of, of growth and real estate values in, on the Central Coast, right, and the amount of building that's happening in particular in San Luis, it, that has achieved more than we thought. And we've actually changed our projection to show that 3.5% versus 3% that we had for a few years. Um, so you'll see a little bit, so total LCFF property tax revenue, that includes um, our special ed property tax transfer. So it puts us at about 87 million for this year, right? You'll see under 2021. Um, if you go down, you'll see this major change in total federal revenues. So that's that $4.4 million in federal COVID funds that received, um, that went towards those things that we discussed. So a major change there. And then you'll see that drop down. Now, again, what we'll see is that we're going to have another 5.4 million that will be put into this budget. Um, for, for federal funds for next year, right? That will go towards some of those learning loss mitigations. Uh, state dollars, as you can see, uh, pretty much the same. We had a big influx. There was a lot of extra money with the CARES Act. Um, this year, I should say, but, but if, you, if you go back a few years ago, uh, the, the state spent down the STRS purse. So there's a lot of, a lot of funds that went towards that. Um, again, they take credit for that green line, right? The state likes to, it's there for revenues and it's there for expenditures. Right. Yeah. Just in my understanding, the stirs and purse stuff, that was money that was owed us in other areas, right? This was money that was not returned in a state mandate and the governor decided to put it into stirs. So it was a positive thing though, right? So okay. The budget was good. <laughs> and so what that did was like Katie had said earlier, that actually helped to reduce the stirs rates long term for school districts so which is an ongoing cost for us so it was a positive right that if any any help that the state can provide to stirs and pers and retirement benefits helps all school districts in the state um so you'll see kind of local revenues there you'll see that big diablo canyon settlement payment last year that we received right and then this year that was cut in half because it was two years we got two years in one year because we didn't get an 1819, we got a both in 1920, and then it 
drop down to the 2.3 million for a few years, and then it goes back up to the 4.6 until we get to that $36 million over the, over the nine year period. Um, you know, the, the fund 20, 40 is, is a, a little bit of, of, you know, money that comes in, uh, mainly, mainly fund 40 really for maintenance projects, but you'll see overall revenues there of 109. So a large chunk of that, like I said, was COVID funds, right? But, um, but again, the positive part of revenues is the property taxes. And so that, you know, when you look at 3.5 all the way along, it's exponential, right? So that really helps us in terms of moving forward. Um, then when we look at expense, again, you're going to see some increases in, um, in certificated and classified, right? Like we talked about, we've added a lot of staff this year um, because of class size, because of needs that we've had. Um, I do think that some of those other numbers that are there, like certificated hourly or substitute or extra duty, um, on both cases, as well as OT, will drop. But, you know, we'll, we'll see savings in those areas. Um, Again, this is what's been budgeted there, but I don't see us because we, we're just now going back to school. Um, I, I don't see that as, as something that will stay in those, those ranges. Um, really benefits is probably the area for the board that you know always is something that I harp on each year when we go through these, right? Stirs and purrs and those the potential increases. Um, and then health and welfare is just a tough one. Um, it, initial indications are it could be up to 5% this year instead wow. of the three and a half that we projected. And so for the board to know that, you know, the, the school district pays the first 5,000 and then it's a 50-50 split. So not only does the cost of health benefits go up significantly for the school district, but it's also the employee. And so it's, it's, it, that's always a tough one, right, for, for staff um, as we look at it. But those are th that benefit that I could almost pull up that same pie chart that Julie Lang showed for, you know, 15 years, right? That showed the benefits and that chunk of benefits just keeps growing and growing and growing. I mean, it's more than what we pay in all classified salaries, right? When you look at the total um, compensation and co total cost of benefits. So uh, benefits are a big, are, are a big piece. Um, Materials and supplies, of course. So again, all of those PPE supplies that we purchase, the ionizers, um, you know, you'll see kind of that, that larger jump in terms of materials and supplies. Now, again, we are not gonna spend all $6.8 million that we have budgeted in this category, but we, we have expended a lot. So, there, you know, a lot of that $7 million, um, a, a big chunk of it was in that supply category. Uh, services and operations, again, that's just kind of currently where we see it. We'll see what happens at the end of the year. Um, equipment outlay, we haven't really been buying a lot of equipment. Uh, we, we did, of course, buy, like I said, a lot of computers. Um, th that should be something that really helps us in out years. So where we normally have kind of an annual plan of buying machines and updating, we really got a, a nice jump on that, I think, for the future. Um, and so, and, and I think that is probably something that we're going to, as a school district, we're going to see teachers utilize that, you know, distance learning for their own classrooms, even right for their own instruction. And, they, you know, so I think having those machines on hand for students, uh, maintaining hotspots, things like that, um, it will be something that really helps staff and students in, into the future. So um, other outgo, you know, we have seen a loss in revenue with some of our tenants, right? With our rental sites. Um, you know, no, we, we don't have any foreign exchange students like we've had in the past, right? So there's, there's been some areas of decrease. Um, we do have kind of that larger uh, piece from the Cayucas Coast Agreement that is in, into the budget that has grown over the past couple of years. That's a positive. But you'll see, despite all of the things that we've spent money on, we still project that we're going to have a, a surplus at the end of the school year. Okay. Um, so again, that's the that's why. And so for for Eve, for you to know, that's why we put this projection together because it, it really kind of shows that where we actually think we're going to end versus what the state makes us turn in with the SACS form, right? And for the budgets that, which would assume that we spent every single penny that we've, we've budgeted. So um, this has been something that I think has been really useful for the board and kind of seeing kind of where we're at. The great news with this 10 year budget, it's those out years in terms of potential deficits, 
you, you can see how much lower they are than what we had even two, three years ago, right? And um, a lot of that is, can be contributed to um, really the, the value of property. The, the, those tax property tax rates and and what that does exponentially over the years so um so i mean i feel good right now where we're at uh, the board's going to have a lot of you know a lot of opportunity um to listen to staff and, and kind of make plans both with the lcap so things that the board wants over the next three years for us to do and continue to do and then also kind of a plan for okay what are the extra things we want to do for kids to get them caught back up right, to help teachers and staff um, to kind of bring them back. And there's actually one more um, item that I'm still kind of unclear, we're still waiting to hear about, and that is gonna be the new governor's AB 86, right? So we should be getting money as well from the state for those students grants. Um, because we are back in person, we're actually eligible for those funds. And so that's a, a beautiful thing for us, right? Which should really help us to have robust, robust um, programs over the summer and, and into the fall. So um, overall, you know, a, a good picture, I think, in terms of us moving forward. And now it's just really prioritizing what we need to do for kids. And just, just if, I, if I may ask, Ryan, um, just a reminder to people that the money that we're expecting from the AB86 Again, it's one-time money and has to be spent. I believe has to be part of it has to be spent on uh, preparing the school, preparing the schools for a return to uh, in-person education, yes. as well as mitigating learning loss. Is that correct? Absolutely. Okay, thank you, Mark. Yeah, thanks. Um, so Ryan, always being <laughs> always being cautious. Um, I have just a couple of questions on basing it on the real estate, and I always ask this, mm -hmm. and I'm going to keep asking it. Um, so when you when you discuss the three percent. You're you're basing that on what? So so we we actually receive kind of word from the county tax assessor's office on okay. what they where they think property taxes are going to be in the out years. Um, so like Katie said, they actually predict that we'll be more in the four to five percent range in the county. Um, we're always a little a little conservative of that because by the time you take out the Dalva Canyon unitary tech, you know those types of things. Um, it's, you know, you don't want to overestimate revenues. And right. so, but even that said, I mean, we were at 3% really just a year ago and moved it up to three and a half for the next couple of years. Um, and then in the out years, we're actually at 3%. So it's, it, you know, just kind of feeling that things will level off again. So again, we try to stay conservative, but I don't want to be too conservative and make it look like, you know, we're, we're not being realistic about where we're at, so. so and, and so we, we did go through a big downturn and property tax values, everything crashed. And so that's that's kind of where my con little it word can happen. And then the, the, the second thing is, I, it, I just feel like we're reaching build out with at least within the city. And, and after that, you know, there's not gonna be a whole lot of new places to get that. And then the other thing is I, I lived in um, Tucson, Arizona for a while and they called it a gray out because what happened, mm -hmm. they were going great guns and then everything, everybody got a lot older. So there's a lot less kids, homes stopped, started being smaller. And so those are just two things I'm concerned about yeah. as, as we make this projection. So I'm really glad you're going under. Sometimes I just get nightmares at night. Sure. 3% is not small enough. Thanks. Uh, other questions from board members regarding either the resolution or the or the 10 the ten year budget projection. Um, otherwise, I'm gonna to go to the public. Uh, Marilyn? Thank you. Um, Mr. Pinkerton, the monies that we received from the state um, that helped to offset uh, our STRS obligation, was that um, Prop 98 deferred monies? No, they were not. Those okay. are, they, they basically, yeah, they, it just, they directly paid STRS, which lowered the actual percentage that we had to pay. Um, and, and it actually lowered it for a few years. But it didn't have anything to do with Prop 98 deferrals? Katie, yeah, I don't think so. Katie, do you? No, I don't believe so. I don't, I don't believe so. So what, do you have any idea, sort of a horseback guess of what we might be owed? in Prop 98 deferred money. So are you talking about mandated, are you talking about our mandated cost funds that they owe us? 
No, well, I it was my belief that we that Prop 98 had not been fully funded. I, I can can I interrupt you for a second? I think Marilyn, what you're talking about is the deferrals that the state that the that the governor enacted last year based on his budget, which were uh, not rescinded this year based on actually the revenues. Is that what you're thinking about, Marilyn? Yes. The Prop 98 deferrals that would have gone into next year. Yeah, that's what that's what I think she's talking about, Ryan. And that really didn't affect us as a basic aid school district. Okay. Okay. Answered my question. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, I'm gonna read this statement one time. This is regarding public comment to the items that we're taking votes on for sure. We're taking three votes this evening. One will be on this item 7.01. Another will be on item 8.03, which is a discussion of the district website. And then again, 10.01, which, um, which is our uh, consent agenda. So we're going to open public comment on this item. As a reminder, if you wish to speak at the meeting, click on the participants icon at the bottom of your screen and select raise your hand. When your name is called, you may restart your video if you wish and unmute your audio. If you need assistance with your video, please let us know and we'll attempt to fix it. If you have a problem with your audio, please click on the thumbs down icon and we'll attempt to assist you. Uh, I don't believe there was any written public comment on this item. So let's go to the, see if there's anybody who wishes to address the board on this item. Is there anyone who wishes to address the board on this item? Okay, I'm seeing none. I'm going to bring it back to the board. Is there, uh, would someone like to make a motion to approve this item? Uh, I actually, I think Ellen got it first, Ellen. Yes, I would, you like would, to make that motion, please? Yes, please. I would um, move to accept the resolution 19-2021, certifying the second interim report. And Mark, I'll take you as a second. Thanks, and I'd like to second it and thank Katie for jumping in here. This, I think, is your first one. So thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, welcome, welcome back to San Luis Obispo, Katie. Thank you. Um, is there any further discussion from the board? Seeing none, I'll bring it back for the vote. This is on item number 7.01, uh, resolution 19, 2021, certifying the second interim report. Uh, Ms. Sheffer. Yes. Mr. Buckman. Yes. Ms. Dobler-Drew. Yes. Dr. Eisendrath Rogers. Ms. Frame. Yes. Ms. Roger. Yes. And I'm a yes. Motion carries 7-0. Let's move on to item number, these are discussion action items. This is item number 8.01, COVID-19 and school reopening update. Dr. Prater and Mrs. McGrath. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Unger. Tonight, we are going to give you our, present our sixth update of what we see as uh, trends for COVID-19 not just locally, but also state and nationally. And so um, if, Ms. McGrath, could you um, present the uh, slide? So uh, the first, first part I would like to say is that we're, we are in a positive trend right now, downward, in terms of national, uh, state, county trends, in terms of uh, COVID infections. And so tonight we'll talk a little bit more about that, and as well as, um, communicate timely information. As uh, Ms. McGrath mentioned in her update, uh, we are gonna talk about athletics. We're gonna talk about uh, the, the various um, um, new uh, revised guidelines from CDPH that are coming our way and, um, and what we can expect to see moving forward. And uh, of course, we're super excited and I'm so proud to be part of a school district and a board that um, acknowledge the importance of getting kids back into school. And uh, I can say to you tonight that all our schools, K-12, are available and open to in-person learning in a hybrid model. And um, I have to say in my, in my uh, visitations across the district, I'm seeing a whole lot of uh, really positive and, um, and energetic parents, students, and staff. While 
no reopening like this is perfect. We're in uncharted territory. I must say how proud I am to see the staff from teachers to paras, classified staff, the bg and staff, our principals, it is my, my own team. It's just a phenomenal um, display of professionalism and competence, and I'm excited to be a part of it. So thank you for supporting that effort. The, the timeline, the only new part of this timeline, other than to remind you that this is one full year of when this nightmare situation has uh, befallen us, and I think we're gonna come out of this and we're gonna be stronger as a result. And um, what I'd like to just point to is the decision by the board in November to reopen in January, pending the red tier for 21 days, was um, revised by um, the fact that the California Department of Public Health revised their guidelines. We revisited that, had tremendous public input. And February 16th, you um, reenacted the reopening plan and uh, with the resolution. And as of tonight, uh, we have our uh, elementary and secondary schools back in, in full. The uh, trends that I'd like to point to uh, that I think are really, you know, quite, quite amazing, actually, when you look at the, the rate of change, it's a, it's a positive thing, if you can ever make sense of a positive thing from someone's loss. But the trends are going down. There are fewer deaths. There are... Um, uh, dramatically fewer deaths than there were just a month ago. And also, there are much fewer cases in terms of rate of change across the nation. So, um, so I won't detail the deaths and the cases, but because you can read that. But still, it's important to see that the rate of change, the rate of acceleration is dramatic and, and in, in a positive way. In California, you can see as well that, um, that from March, where we are now from February to March, it's again, very dramatic um, in terms of the, um, the, the rate. Now I can point to this, that, um, that we went from, in February went from having an increase of half a million, half a million new cases in the month of February related to March, um, where we are halfway through the month, um, dramatically less. 72,000 new cases in California. So we are seeing a difference. The vaccinations out there are making a difference and um, more to come on that. The next slide um, is something I just wanna just keep putting out there. Again, showing the dramatic nature of how COVID really does spike. It gains this energy. It, it's almost textbook how Dr. Fauci um, explains how this works and why it's so important that we listen to public health advice, that we do the things that we're doing here tonight when we gathered um, and, and form groups that we do so intelligently and carefully. And, and that's what we're doing. And because of that, you're seeing this dramatic decrease. The um, blue will continue to rise because that's the uh, total cases. However, the new cases from January to the date of this publication went from 7,400 uh, new cases in the month of January. And as of this posting, we're down to, what is that? 279 new cases. And again, it's a, it's a pretty amazing uh, decline. And, um, and as well as the case rate has dropped from, in January from 46 per 100,000 now we're at 5.7 and that's adjusted. Okay, so that's a pretty dramatic drop in a period of two months. Okay, and uh, this next slide you've seen before and we just keep adding to it. Uh, what I will point to is again, the, the um, sig we're still in the red tier. However, the positive, and, and that is the adjusted case rate of 5.7 with, um, the positivity rate of 1.9. So we're in the yellow tier in terms of positivity rate. We remain in the red tier uh, when considered for adjusted, uh, the, the adjusted rate, uh, we're, we're strongly in the red tier and going in the right direction. Now, 
But what I do want to share with you before we uh, move forward in this presentation, we learned uh, last week that Cal Poly, who has been instrumental in getting San Luis Obispo County into the red tier because of the frequency of their testing of their students and staff. And that rate of testing really helped our adjusted rate fall. And um, what I heard this last week, which I think is something to be aware of, is Cal Poly has moved from the type of testing that allows for the adjusted rate formula to work in our favor to a different type of testing and it's rapid saliva testing, um, but it doesn't count in the adjusted rate. So when you look at our current case rate unadjusted, that puts us in the purple. So I just want all of us to be aware, I don't see us going back into the purple, but we are hugging that line. Um, in the, so, the, um, so it's something we need to pay attention to and look at. I still see the trends moving downward. And um, now it's not as great as I'd hoped. Um, we should be seeing about 20 or fewer cases per day. And we're, we're, we're up um, 37 uh, cases today. So we're not out of the woods yet. However, I do want to add that even since we reopened our schools, the guidelines say that even if we go back into purple, as long as we're 25 per 100,000 uh, or below per CDPH guidelines, we keep our schools open, okay? So I want you to know that we have that uh, clearly in our, in our sites, we do understand it. Uh, by the end of this month, we expect that all of our employees will either have their vaccine or, or be scheduled to get their vaccine for those who wish to have it. So that's really great news. It's really fantastic news, and um, and I will hand this off to my uh, very capable assistant, Sue Kim McGrath. Great, right, thanks, Dr. Prater. So, um, just to give you some updates, kind of uh, specifically where the district is currently, you will see, um, as you know, we have our COVID website. So lots of up-to-date uh, information there. I'll give you some of the general information you can find over here on the side. You'll see that at the stop top, of course, it reports uh, the red tier, as Dr. Porter was saying. At the bottom, you'll notice our staff testing. So uh, make sure to notice the date range there. So you can see that we keep track of the positivity rate in our surveillance testing, the number of uh, positive cases that take place, as well as those on site. Um, positivity rates there as well. If I can link to this website, let's see if this will cooperate. Great, so what you'll find here is we have our dashboard. And so let me show you the latest information that you can find here um, on our website for everyone to see. So that is the um, information I did a screenshot of there. And then if you go to the second link here, district data by school site. For those of you that want to um, keep up with that, you will see that we update that on a weekly basis. So this is gonna be the positive cases and you can see the range here from February 28th to March 6th. And so that was updated today. We keep this in line with public health reporting. That way the uh, data stays consistent. But you'll see the number of students and staff on site has increased dramatically since we looked at it last. And you will see um, many places during that time um, that had no cases. You can see the summary information at the bottom that I do think is interesting. Uh, so especially look at, um, notice the total positive cases, that was for that one week range. And our cumulative totals are there at the bottom so that we've had 35 uh, student positive cases for those students that were in person, as well as 46 staff positive cases, keeping in mind that we've had, um, you know, at one point over a thousand students during the day in person, as well as uh, extracurriculars um, as well. So um, important, as I said earlier in my update, just to remember that, um, you know, it's definitely important to be diligent and uh, to do our parts so that we can continue to keep uh, students in person as long as possible. 
just to go over some of our key mitigation strategies. Um, what, we're, what we're finding of why schools are allowed to be open is because they're finding with these key mitigation strategies in place, that there's actually less spread on a school site versus uh, community spread. So here's the uh, key pieces, and we've, uh, I know, talked about this a few times, so I won't go into too much detail on this. But signage, um, I know, as we see in this room, as well as um, things, there's a picture there when we were at a school site, um, great markers, traffic flow marked, looking for ways to uh, decrease congregations. Lots of training and information has uh, taken place, clarifying questions, as well as information being distributed. Uh, to parents, to students, to staff, et cetera. The use of mask, um, and I think we were fortunate that some stronger language uh, came out around mask and really the um, school's ability to even enforce that. Physical distancing, as you know, um, is currently six feet, although we're you know, hearing talk of different things, we have not seen any CDC guidance around that yet. Hand washing, um, really, I think the emphasis has become a lot on hand washing, hand sanitizer really reduced uh, when it came to kind of spread on surfaces. You'll remember when we first started, um, you know, just a lot of information was not understood about the virus. So a lot of extra precautions were put in place. So as we learn more and more that it was primarily spread through droplets, um, that hand washing becomes a key component. Increased ventilation, um, you know, as Ryan mentioned earlier, lots of great work. I know that took a ton of uh, work as well as funding, um, but great efforts there. COVID testing in place, our surveillance testing, and then looking for um, appropriate times that we're uh, testing others. Quarantine and isolation, and there's been some questions about when there is a positive case in the process that we use. I'm happy to answer any of those questions, but uh, we conduct contact tracing, of course, when there is a positive case. In a school circumstance, we're different than a lot of other types of organizations where it's harder to track who you've been around. In schools, we know where people are, right? We know who they've been around primarily. Um, in some circumstances, yes, we rely on a person to identify those other people for us. But in general, um, you know, a school site can tell you where a student is at all times. So contact tracing for us is slightly easier than within some other um, areas. Health screening, so we have used Parent Square. District-wide, we're using Parent Square for all adults and all students. It's a daily health screening that takes place. Um, and keeping in mind that it's so important to change the culture around coming to school campuses with symptoms. So that health screening is kind of like a personal training. Do you take that you know, little second in the morning to just assess yourself to make sure that you're not coming onto campus with symptoms? And then, um, of course, coordinating vaccinations. And you heard tonight about uh, the great progress that's been happening in that supply increasing. So the district-wide health screening, just as I said, staff and students, um, you can access that daily right through Parent Square. People can do that through an app on their phone or through a website. Uh, really easy to complete, just takes a few seconds, but it is that moment to pause and make sure that we're not coming on campus with any symptoms. So let me uh, go through these bullets. Here are some of the changes and updates. Um, as Dr. Prater mentioned, it, it is ongoing, right? This has been our world for a year that uh, as soon as we think we have a grip on it, it changes. And that's, um, that's good in some ways because typically it means that they're learning uh, more in science and we need to follow that information. So the, the first bullet there, our great part that we've all mentioned, pre-K through 12, anyone that selected in person um, is now returned to school. Class by class visits, um, you know, just a shout out to Holly Warwick, Resolute Associates, um, that has gone um, site by site to do mitigation strategies. Chris Bonin and, and Ryan Pinkerton have gone around and really looked at classroom by classroom the physical setup of what needs to take place. And um, Holly did a great job of giving input to principals as far as the specific things that needed to be addressed on the campus. And I think it's one of the many elements that went into making a really smooth opening. So athletics, we have had a lot of recent updates when it comes to athletics. And I know that this is a, a topic that we hear from the public a lot about. Um, there was an added requirement that we have to have a safety plan specific per site to athletics. So you'll remember that we talked about our district-wide safety plan, right? So we created the district-wide safety plan that's published on the website. 
we submitted it to public health, and we submitted it to the state. Met all the dates and timelines needed there. But with athletics, they said, you need to also now create a site-specific athletic safety plan. So uh, we are in the middle of doing that, uh, getting pretty close, and are changing some of the information, and then that'll be submitted as well. Part of that safety plan says that uh, hazard mitigation walks need to take place on the athletic facilities now. So we're uh, conducting those as well, and those will be taking place this week. Uh, there was a change to indoor uh, competitions being allowed. So now we're allowed to do indoor out and outdoor um, sports are being played. And then just like I said earlier, spectators uh, now being allowed for outdoor sports only, not spectators at indoor sports, but spectators allowed at outdoor sports up to 20% of the physical capacity. Um, there's student testing and we're looking into this. Um, we may be able to use public health facilities um, for free opportunities there for student athletes to be able to participate in, in testing. So that was a great piece of progress we heard Friday as well. Like I said, these daily health screenings taking place at home, um, there has been kind of less focus on surface contamination and really an increased focus on hand hygiene. There is more allowed for the sharing of equipment kind of along that same line of thinking when there's less uh, surface contamination, um, but keeping hands clean being an important part of that. There was also stronger mask language, as I mentioned, um, even saying must exclude for those that are purely um, defying and being defiant about it, choosing uh, not to do it and not being willing to correct it. Of course, there's some that have um, a doctor's note and true medical reason for not being able to do that. There was a change to band and choir. As you can imagine, uh, since the spread is through droplets that, um, band instruments, you know, you can imagine playing a trumpet trombone, um, being a, a little more of a risky action. So they did find that um, band and choir would be allowed outdoors. And uh, when I was on campuses this week, you could, you know, it was great to visit them. They're spread out outside and um, playing sounds like a, a great band again. So that's good. Um, quarantine days uh, did change for school settings that um, there's instances where they reduce that from 14 days to 10. So we just follow public health guidance. Um, that's not something that, uh, you know, the school district creates, but public health guides us and when it's appropriate to reduce that from 10, 14 to 10. Of course, we do have to still be very cautious about adults gathering. So we've encouraged and talked to um, school sites about not having a uh, staff room usage. You know, it's a good time to go grab your food out of the refrigerator if you need, heat it up, but then head outside or head somewhere else that would be better than uh, adults removing masks and sitting indoor gathered, uh, eating and drinking. Um, virtual staff meetings, for example, um, are something that we're saying is still the better idea. Again, you want to reduce um, opportunities that adults are gathering. And although we know uh, we love our volunteers and parents and things that they do for our schools, uh, we're still saying no volunteers at this time. One key piece of information that we're still waiting for is what they're calling gathering guidance. So that has a big impact on some of our end of year celebration kind of things like graduation being a great example. So public health is waiting on that guidance. Um, I know they've been really tapping their toes waiting for it and, uh, and we are too. So they keep saying any minute now, uh, we're expecting guidance from the state about what gatherings, uh, how many are allowed depending on the tier, et cetera. So whenever we have that information, we will be able to finalize our graduation plans and communicate that. Happy to answer any questions and... Okay, thank you, Kim. You bet. Um, first thing we're gonna do is I'll go to the board and see if the board has any questions. Again, this is not a discussion item, but I will take public comment after I go to the board. So is there anybody from the board that has a question for Mrs. McGrath or Dr. Prater? Do uh, Eve Dobler-Drew, Ms. Dobler-Drew. Yeah, for, so Mrs. McGrath, the 10 day quarantine and the 14 day quarantine, I haven't looked at that now for several weeks, but um, I wonder if it's changed since what I read whereby, and I was curious about it, uh, whereby the, um, if you 
were exposed, you would need to quarantine for 14 days. But if you actually came down with a, as a positive case, you would only need to quarantine for 10 days. There has been a difference and still in, the, in a public case, that 10 versus 14 days is still a difference that you'll find in a public setting. Um, school guidance sometimes is slightly different than what the just community guidance is. So like I said, we um, follow public health guidance when it comes to that. And what we're um, hearing is that in some cases with a positive test, that 10 days is allowable. So we stay in coordination with public health and and um, follow their guidance. Yes, I do too. Thank you. <laughs> you bet. Um, other questions from board members? Great, well, thank you, Ms. McGrath. Now I'm going to go to the public. Um, is there anybody from the public that would like to address the board on this item? I'm seeing no one, so let's move on to item number 8.02, learning recovery and child care plan update. But before I do, I would just ask if there's anybody who needs translation services, if you could raise your hand, use, raise your Zoom hand, please, so that we have an idea about that. Okay, good, thank you very much. Let's move on to item number 8.02, learning recovery and child care plan update. Dr. Prater and Mrs. McGrath. Yes, good evening, everyone. Uh, Rick Mayfield here, Director of Learning and Achievement, and I'm gonna present this uh, item along with uh, Laura Storm, who's Principal on Special Assignment, and Diane Frost, who's Director of Student Support Services. And then Ryan will also um, give us an update on childcare at this point in time. So it's kind of a group effort here tonight. Uh, am I able to share my screen, Mandy? Yes, you can. Thank you. Okay, so this is update number three, and uh, we've discussed um, learning recovery, and now we're developing plans for what will occur, uh, what is occurring now, what will occur in the summer, and then we're, of course, developing our three-year LCAP, uh, new three-year LCAP cycle uh, for next year and beyond. Uh, we know we have some greater needs uh, for next year in terms of learning recovery. And of course, you know, you'll see that uh, within our uh, LCAP plan when that's presented to you. But tonight, we wanted to just give you a little bit uh, more detail uh, into what we're planning and um, also go into some details about FastBridge, which is an, a new assessment to our district uh, and one that we have discussed several times, but haven't been able to give the board uh, a lot of detail on what that is. So we'll do that uh, this evening. Okay, so, you know, the paradigms around recovery are that we, we wanna look at things as always through an equity focus. Uh, we know that our most vulnerable students have been the greatest impacted uh, and we wanna make sure that we can meet their needs uh, in what we do. Uh, and of course, uh, we, you know, we're using our multi-tiered systems of support uh, to provide uh, support for teachers and students as they come back. Uh, as always, first best instruction, the regular teacher in the regular classroom uh, is the uh, number one way to uh, improve student learning. Uh, and so we wanna have our focus there as always. Uh, we know that student and staff wellness and social emotional learning or SEL uh, will be important as we move forward and as students transition back to school. Uh, we want to use data at every, at every point uh, to drive our decision making and to monitor our progress. Uh, you know, none of the high benchmarks that our students uh, have in terms of uh, assessment and, you know, getting ready for college are going away. And so we have to uh, help students to prepare uh, to be ready to meet those uh, benchmarks. And then we want to involve all groups uh, as we, you know, make these decisions uh, and make our plans for the future. And that happens through leadership teams uh, at sites and around the district. Uh, again, our main, you know, looking at the whole child, our main focus areas are academic growth. You know, as kids are back in session now, we'll get, we'll be able to assess and get a good idea of where they're at you know, in terms of learning and where they should be uh, in the grade level span that they're at. Uh, we have a social emotional focus and Mrs. Frost will go over that. Uh, later tonight, um, both for staff and, and for students. 
We know that families, especially in our hybrid model, our Plan B hybrid model, uh, have child care needs, uh, and those are ongoing, and we'll discuss those. Uh, and then, you know, again, we're planning uh, currently um, what the new three-year LCAP is going to look like uh, and what uh, supports uh, we'll have in place for our students. And then, of course, we're linking that to our multi-tiered system of support, or MTSS. Um, you know, for academic and social recovery at the top of our list are high school graduation and credit recovery. Uh, we're looking at the number of students at our comprehensive high schools that uh, will be in jeopardy of graduation uh, because of the effects of COVID, the numbers of uh, Ds and Fs that have occurred. Uh, and we're, you know, talking about strategies of how to help these students to be successful. Those would include doing things now to help kids recover those grades uh, before their final uh, uh, in the uh, spring, in the late spring. We also know that K-2 literacy is gonna be critical. You know, K-2 uh, learning how to read is a critical time for all children. And for our kindergarten students last year, our current first grade students this year, their literacy has been greatly interrupted by uh, COVID and by distance learning. It's difficult to teach reading via distance learning. Uh, and our teachers have done a remarkable job. Uh, but again, you know, it's impacted, slowed down, made more difficult uh, by distance learning and through Zoom. Um, anecdotally, we've heard great things from teachers with kids coming back already, uh, that, you know, they're able to uh, get the instruction to students. They've learned more about students in a very short period of time than they did in months on uh, distance learning. Uh, as I mentioned previously, social emotional needs and learning will be uh, important as well. Uh, it's for all of us, it's a traumatic event, the, the uh, events of the last year and for kids uh, especially uh, and our staff and teachers uh, as well need support in that area. We wanna reduce the learning gaps. You know, that's been a long-term goal of this board, our district, uh, reducing the learning gaps, uh, even more critical now in these times. Uh, we need to focus on, you know, accurately identifying needs, right? So we know that social emotional uh, needs are out there, but what exactly are they? You know, what and what supports exactly do kids need as we transition back? And so we'll be able to uh, identify those through uh, assessments and through observations. Uh, and then our summer learning opportunities are um, rapidly being planned. You know, it's uh, already middle of March and summer is uh, quickly approaching. And so we'll have plans for this coming summer. Uh, and then we'll also have long-term plans uh, for a more robust summer learning program uh, as we move forward. As I mentioned earlier, um, Fast Bridge is uh, relatively new to our district. And so we wanted tonight uh, to have Mrs. Storm go into a little bit more detail on what exactly Fast Bridge is and, and what information it gives us and how do teachers use it. So, Laura. Good evening, everybody. Um, we have been promising more Fast Bridge for several meetings now. So, we're going to dig in a little bit tonight. Um, FAST actually stands for Formative Assessment System for Teachers. It was developed out of the University of Minnesota um, by a gentleman who was working on his, um, I believe it was his doctorate in special education, and he was frustrated with the fact that he couldn't get information to drive instruction um, about his, his students' learning. Um, so he developed um, FAST, and what ended up happening was schools in Minnesota started to use it um, free. And then all of a sudden they wanted support using it and they were reaching out with questions about using it. And before he knew it, he had a company um, who was then purchased by Illuminate who we use for a lot of our um, data management. So um, FAST is very research based. Um, the university practitioners are still involved in the company. Um, and are still doing research and testing around um, the different assessments and tools. So the goal really is to tell us, this is the assessment. Now, teacher, here is what you need to do based on that information. So really closing that gap. Um, there's two different 
sorts of assessments in FastBridge. There's computer adaptive. So it will get harder or easier depending on how the student is doing and then kind of give a level. And then there's a curriculum based measure, which is to be used more frequently for really targeted skills. Um, you can even use a CBM weekly um, if you want to for progress monitoring. And then it recommends interventions based on um, the student performance on the assessments. So like I was saying, there's progress monitoring, which is done on a weekly or biweekly basis to see is the student responding to the instruction we're giving them. Um, so in FastBridge, it will even give you a, a trend line for a student and then you enter the CBM data and it tells you whether or not the student is meeting that trend line, if they're exceeding it, or if they are not progressing at the rate they should be. So you can adjust your intervention. Um, it's really powerful in that way. Um, and then it also provides that universal screening kind of, I think I compared it at one point in a presentation to like going to the dentist, right? And how they just check your teeth. And so doing that universal screening um, to check where our students are at in reading and math. Um, and then we started looking at this tool long before COVID. Um, we were looking at this back in October of 2019 um, and then decided to um, move forward with it. And then all of this happened. And so we've been trying to roll with rolling out a new assessment system and distance learning um, and trying things out as we go. But um, it's, been a, it's been a pretty good rollout um, and we're able to get in rooms. So, What's included in FastBridge? So like I said, that universal screening um, in reading, math, and um, it has a behavior tool, which Mrs. Frost is gonna talk more about. Um, and then progress monitoring. So I mentioned that um, before about how you can do that quick, I mean, like minutes um, assessment and see if the instruction or the intervention is working. Um, it's reading and math, and then behavior, and then a lot of reports. So it'll give you school level reports, classroom level, individual student, you can put in student groups. So there's lots of ways to do reporting um, in FastBridge. It's really powerful that way. You wanna click for me, Mr. Mayfield? Sure. So there's three main uses for FastBridge. Um, that universal screening. So we did a universal screening in the fall um, with first through eighth grade in language arts. And after we did it, we met with all of the teachers and talked to them about how to look at their reports, what to do with the information from the universal screening and how to um, kind of move forward with that and group students and do all of those kind of things. Um, we actually ended up with a um, small pilot at Slow High um, with mostly ninth graders. Um, they did a reading universal screener. Um, and just as we were getting ready to meet with them to walk through how to read all their reports, they found out they were gonna be coming back in person. So they said, can you guys give us a little time and then we'll get together. So we're gonna get together with them and do the same thing, um, but really guiding teachers through how to look at their data. Um, and then you can drill it down, right? So you get kind of the overview for the class and then you can look at certain student groups and individual students. And then once you've identified a student need and you start an intervention, you can progress monitor and make sure it's working. So those are kind of the three main uses in FastBridge. Um, there's other little things it does too, but those are the big three. Um, so I wanna just highlight one report. Um, one of our favorite reports is screening to intervention. Um, so it's like the dentist checkup report. And then this example um, that I screenshot for you is saying that there is a, a whole group classroom kind of need. So um, I won't do it right now, but you could click on the link there and it shows you the plan for the whole group. So it tells the teacher in the plan, these are the things that the students probably already know. These are the things they need. Here would be some instruction you should do and some things you make sure to teach. And here's some ideas of how to do that. So for the whole class. 
And then Mr. Mayfield, if you wanna go forward for me. So then it gives you this. So I covered student names. This is an actual screenshot from our district. And you can see there's some exclamation marks there under phonics and fluency and general reading. So one exclamation point is some risk. Two is high risk. So it tells you, oh, we need to look at this student in this area. There's high risk there. Then it tells you also it under reading program, you can change it from Lexile to be an approximated or estimated um, Fontes and Pinnell level. So it gives you kind of a general reading level and then it'll give you a plan. So it says, the one I'm pointing out, it says this student really needs work in vocabulary and comprehension and you should work with them using reading or the word cards. So you can click on that word cards plan. It tells you all about how to deliver that intervention and gives you all the materials for it. And it tells you, oh, you wanna progress monitor that? You should be giving them the CBM reading with the CBM comprehension to make sure that they're moving forward in that intervention. Now, teachers love to sort these columns because then you can find commonalities and make groups. So you can see there, there's a couple students with fluency needs with repeated reading with a partner, that would be a great group. Um, so, and you can do that whole grade level too, um, to kind of look at these interventions and the groupings. So we love screening to intervention because it gives us a lot of next steps. So what's next with FastBridge? Well, we've been doing it distance learning. Um, so now we're getting out to do some in-person assessment. Um, I think I at one point had mentioned that Michelle Cass, one of our TOSAs and Chelsea Smiley, the other, had done some in-person assessment with students that are back at CL Smith. But now we're going to be giving the online tools in person for the older students. So that's exciting. We have a couple places where we have intervention teachers who want to try those progress monitoring tools that I mentioned, where it gives you that trend line and kind of matching up to see if students are moving. Um, so right now we're looking for places we can test that out, work out the kinks kind of on a small scale before we take it bigger. Um, we have one site where um, they <laughs> asked us to train their pod leaders in the fast bridge interventions. Um, they want to deliver those in pods. Um, there's other sites where the pods are a chance for pullout like LLI and things, um, but we're going to try training some pod leaders. So that'll be interesting to see how that goes with like some classified staff who maybe don't know as much about intervention delivery. Um, we've partnered really closely with our district level literacy intervention lead, Jenny Appel, to talk about how do you fold a five or 10 minute fast intervention in with level literacy intervention and how do you progress monitor that? Um, and then our TOSA team's looking at the fast math interventions and how they might align with our Bridges intervention curriculum. So trying to also make some alignment in there. You don't have to only use fast bridge interventions to use fast bridge. So you can plug in your own interventions too and progress monitor those. So we wanna see how does that work and, and what's next with that. So lots of things kind of on the horizon. I'm gonna turn it over to Mrs. Frost to talk about um, the behavior part of FastBridge. Very good, thank you. A uh, pleasure to be here tonight. You might remember our last board meeting. We spent an awful lot of time on social and emotional learning, and we did touch on um, the SABERS assessment, which is the social and emotional behavior risk screening through FastBridge. There's a lot of benefits to um, using SABERS, and we've already fully implemented one portion of it, but what we do love is that it is with fast bridge. So it's part of this suite that we're using in the district. So as you can see, we have already done the student self-rating screener across the district, second 
through 12th grade. That was completed in February. Right now, our care teams, and you might remember that we have a care team at every school site in the district, and those are supervised by our um, counselor on special assignment, Shelly Benson, and of course, the counselor at that site. They are looking at the data right now analyzing the needs of students and then providing tiered intervention. The SABER screener is really a two part screener. We have the student self screener, but then the teacher also completes a rating scale for the students. That was not implemented this year and there's a really good reason why. Our teachers are supposed to have their students in person for six to eight weeks for that to be a really effective analysis. So that's going to be implemented next year. But we're really happy with having used my sabers and our ability to analyze the data that we have and then provide the tiered support. So Rick, if you could go to the next slide. Sure. And then just talking about what um, the focus of our school counselors is right now. You know, it's, it's a big deal for our counselors, like across the districts, our teachers, our administrators, our paraeducators, we're all so excited to have the students back. For our counselors, we know that we really have to look at the effects of the closure and dis distance learning on the kids that we now have back in front of us. So you'll see that um, first point there, professional development was provided by every school counselor for their staff at a staff meeting and they looked at identifying those struggling students. What does that look like in your classroom and where do you send them? What's the tiered support we have? Um, our elementary school counselors and teachers are using additional second steps lessons to support their students. And remember, Second Steps, other than Monarch Grove, is across the district at our elementary schools. Our middle school advisories, and you heard from Denise Baca and Scott Scaldi a couple of weeks ago, are continuing their focus on student well-being, mental health, and academic planning. And then at the high school level, we talked about the counseling classrooms through Google, um, our school-wide um, welcome back and orientation activities, and academic planning that's currently going on. I know it's interesting to see academic planning on that list when we talk about SEL, and we spent a lot of time on that two weeks ago as well. Um, Shelly Benson, if she were here, would tell you that that academic planning is self-awareness, it's self-management, it's responsible decision-making, all of that which comes in under that SEL umbrella as well. So just a short, uh, I guess, summary of where we're going and what we're doing with our kids right now. Thank you. So uh, again, you know, grade and credit recovery uh, is gonna be super critical uh, as we move forward. Uh, the pods continue to work uh, in limited uh, um, capacity, but they're still functioning and focused on recovery. Uh, we have summer recovery plans uh, happening, uh, credit deficiency options, uh, and we're discussing grading as well with our, uh, especially our secondary teachers. Um, to go into a little bit of detail on summer planning, we're, we're currently planning to have students in person uh, first grade rising, what we call rising first grade, our current kindergartners, rising first graders through 12th graders. So in person at all of our uh, school sites, we will, however, only have two school sites within town and kids will come from all the school sites to those two sites at CL Smith and Hawthorne Elementary, and then at uh, Baywood Elementary uh, on the coast. And then our secondary sites were still in discussion as to whether or not we want to have all the kids together at one school or middle schoolers at their uh, respective middle school and high schoolers at high school. But first, first through sixth grade, we'll focus on English language arts, math, and then a variety of STEAM opportunities. And we're trying to be very creative and make it as attractive as we possibly can for students coming back. You know, giving them the same old thing uh, in the summer isn't going to be uh, the answer to their uh, learning uh, issues. And so we're looking at how do we get our um, I Innovate uh, TOSAs and labs involved? You know, how do we maybe even do PE 
uh, and art that kids have been missing? And how can we incorporate some of these uh, activities uh, into our curriculum? Um, the Teachers College at uh, Columbia, Lucy Calkins, which is the English language arts curriculum that we use, has produced some really high quality summer units of study, uh, which we're gonna take advantage of um, and get, and then Bridges Math uh, as well. Um, you, uh, we'll have some curriculum available for summer, including intervention. Uh, we're gonna pay teachers at a higher rate of pay than we have in the past uh, because we know a couple of things. Number one, we know that teachers have worked extremely hard this year in distance learning and now transitioning back. And we wanna attract our best and brightest to come and work with these kids uh, uh, in the summer. Uh, we are also going to require a lot more planning uh, and student support uh, than we probably typically would do in summertime. And so uh, offering per diem pay, I think will be a critical component of our summer uh, program. In seventh and eighth grade recently, uh, we've done mostly a summer experience program, which is hands-on learning, uh, gardening, cooking type activities uh, uh, to get kids accustomed to the middle school environment. Uh, but of course, now we have academic needs that we need to address as well. So we'll have some small groups of in-person students doing English language arts and math activities in addition to the summer experience activities. And then in grades nine through 12, we'll do what we always do, which is offer uh, online learning via the APEX platform so that students can do uh, grade and credit recovery as well as acceleration in original credit classes. Uh, last summer, uh, we served about 550 students in those classes and we'll offer those again uh, this summer, but we'll also have uh, small groups of in-person students, uh, again, our most vulnerable students. Um, and we're uh, in the process of designing what that looks like right now. Um, and so that's our summer learning. We're working with uh, Dr. Debbie Blow as a consultant uh, who's been excellent in coming up with uh, ideas, helping us plan, uh, and will be key in planning the professional development that we will uh, give to teachers before summer uh, begins. Mr. Mayfield, can I ask you a question yes. about the last slide, please? Of course. Um, you mentioned grades one to six that there would be two sites in, in town that would be Hawthorne and C.L. Smith and Baywood on the coast. I'm a little concerned about our Morro Bay students. Um, can you talk to me about the plan for our Morro Bay students? Because it might be difficult for them to get from Morro Bay into Los Osos. Yeah, yeah, we're working on that with Mrs. Gould and uh, you know, aware that transportation is gonna be a big need uh, for our families. You know, having it at Baywood uh, allows for students at Monarch Grove and Baywood to relatively easily attend uh, because it's, you know, in close proximity. Uh, and then, you know, we'll do what we can to provide transportation from Morro Bay. We know that it's limited, uh, but we'll do what we can to provide transportation from uh, Del Mar and Morro Bay uh, to Baywood um, for summer school. And the same thing in town. You know, we, we don't know what the parameters uh, will be once we get to uh, June, uh, mid-June. And we're hopeful that uh, maybe transportation will loosen up some. Um, but uh, we're certainly taking that into consideration. Absolutely. Thank you. And then child care, Mr. Pinkerton, you want to give us yes. a little update on child care? Yeah, so kind of along with that summer program is uh, kind of waiting for the sites to be selected. Uh, and then I'm going to be working directly with the city of Slow, Morro Bay, and um, the YMCA to see how they can really make an extended day for students that are in summer school. So even if, you know, let's say a Morro Bay parent had to drop their kid off of Baywood, their student off of Baywood, would we have, have an, a program there to where the student could stay full day? So at least if you're going to make that drive, it's, you know, you, you have that extended time. So um, I shared kind of the latest numbers with the board in terms of child care with Friday notes. So we do have some wait lists in the city of San Luis Obispo schools. We have room at the YMCA. Um, we, we were having some issues at Monarch Grove just in terms of getting enough students to sign up. So they're continually working on that. And I'm working with the Y to ensure that that program stays functioning. Um, we, we are using a, a pod leader at Teach Elementary School to keep that program going. So at all of our elementary sites, there are programs. 
Um, the wait list is, is kind of an interesting dynamic. And I've talked to Megan Berger, who leads the child care for San Luis City. You know, a, a lot of times people will sign up, but then when they're called, they won't accept a position. So that's something she's working towards. Um, she currently is looking at trying to open up a new program, uh, another class, I should say, at both uh, Bishop's Peak and Pacheco after sp spring break. So our hope is that we'll get even more students um, who, who are able to attend. So they're still under the really strict guidelines of 14 to one staff and all of the COVID implications and can't mix cohorts. And I mean, it's very almost like the preschool guidelines that, that they have to follow. So I was, I, I was hopeful that they could do kind of an AM PM, have more kids like double up in terms of programs, but they can't. And so it, it's just really limiting. And for them, it's really just finding staff to be able to do it. So the sites are willing to provide rooms and um, we'll do whatever we can to assist. And, and so just doing our best to try to accommodate any and all students and, and parents um, through this time. So I, I do look forward to working with them now that I know the sites to have both child care programs um, at our schools where we don't have summer school, as well as extending those programs at, at those other sites. So um, hopefully the six foot spacing rule will decrease. So we'll actually be able to offer a lot more transportation services and um, I mean, the way things are going, it seems like that's going to be a possibility for the summer. So I'm super hopeful that that's going to be something that we'll be able to, to you know, to do. I think one of the keys of kind of reducing sites also was to really take a lot of the impetus off, off of our elementary site principles that have been working. So by, by doing that, it just, you know, we can put staff, wrap it around and, and hopefully, um, you know, really let some of the other staff that that's been working all year kind of have a little bit of a break too. I think for some of our sites, so we'll uh, we'll do everything we can, of course. Okay, then just to wrap up, you know, uh, the pods are supporting our hybrid model currently uh, with students either in the AM or PM. Uh, we continue to monitor uh, the progress students are making, and now that we have them in person. Uh, we can do a more accurate job of measuring that. Uh, we're continuing with our summer conversations and uh, academic opportunities. Uh, we're working on our LCAP three-year plan. Uh, I finished the uh, LCAP presentation today and I'm gonna put it to a screencast uh, hopefully tomorrow and it'll be ready to roll out on Friday in our uh, weekly newsletter. And we'll be able to get um, community and staff input on our new uh, LCAP um, three-year plan. Uh, and then, you know, we're also working to strengthen community and our foundation partnerships. And they're um, as involved as we can possibly have them be in, in this whole process. So with that, I'd be happy to take uh, questions as would uh, Mrs. Storm and Mrs. Frost. So I, let's see, I know that Mrs. Frame has a question and then we'll uh, go to the rest of the board and then I'll take it to the public to see if the public has any questions. Although th again, this is not an action item. So Mrs. Frame. Um, thank you, Mr. Um, Mr. Mayfield and Ms. Storm. I, um, I'm wondering, um, you know, I, I'm, I think I'm, I'm thinking in terms of LCAP um, that we're gonna be putting money for, you know, additional money for our, our fast bridge. So I'm wondering, as we're looking at um, FastBridge, do we have um, kind of an efficacy and an effectiveness report for FastBridge from districts that are similar demographically to ours for this program? And I guess the reason why I'm asking that is so as, a, as trustees, what can we look for, you know, the trends from this, this program? So that's one question. Um, the other thing is, um, as we're looking to put this into place, um, if, if there's information from other districts that are similar to ours that have used this, kind of what is that benchmark, um, like percent of learning that they recover or something like that, that we can look to, you know, that trend, you know, what can we, what can we look forward to? So, um, I'm wondering in the if in the LCAP, you know, presentation or more, we could you know get more kind of a I guess contextualized information from um, uh, FastBridge. Is that making sense? Sure. Uh, okay. Laura, yeah, absolutely. Um, and we can pull um, 
their efficacy research, um, you know, they're very academic oriented. So of course they have a lot of that going on. Um, mm -hmm. As far as recovery, I don't, you know, everyone's in a similar boat. And so it's hard to know exactly what to expect, um, but they definitely will have data on what they've seen in the past from schools and districts. Um, one thing that's really encouraging to me is that we are actually looking at trying to pursue a county level pricing because mm -hmm. so many of our neighboring districts are wanting to also adopt FastBridge. So um, I know Atascadero, I believe, either has it or is looking at getting it. I know Lucia Mar is probably purchasing. Um, and then some of the smaller districts also want to hop on board. So um, that's really exciting for a county collaboration um, if we all get in on like a group pricing. So um, there are other districts in our area and then across the country that are using it. Um, so we can definitely pull that for, for the board. Great, right. thank you. And one last thing is, um, this seems like a really critical piece of um, that plan is what are the ways that we're going to get that teacher feedback? Because really this seems to be really dependent on that teacher in the classroom or that pod leader who's ever doing it. So um, what would be, or I guess, you know, the, the plan that we would get that kind of um, systematic feedback from teachers on, you know, how it's working for them, what tweaks and things that they're being made so we can continue to really look at that program as we, um, I guess, move through the, the three-year cycle. So I guess those yeah, are the things that- That's a great question and uh, a, a great point, right? That we're constantly working with teachers to get their feedback on the systems that we have in place. You know, assessment is critical to instruction. It's an integral part of the system. You know, you have to know where students are at uh, in order to give them exactly the instruction that they need to move forward. And so, you know, getting feedback from teachers on how valuable these systems are, of course, is, is part of the process, yeah. So before we go on, um, Evelyn, and, and I'm gonna ask both Evelyn and Mrs. Storm this question. It sounds like you asked for some information. Oh, no. I know. Um, first of all, Laura, I'd like to know what it is you heard that Evelyn was asking for, and then I'm going to go to the board to see if the board has an interest in hearing that information as well. But I'd like to hear from yeah. Mrs. Storm to make sure yeah. that I understand that she understands it, what Mrs. Frame was asking for. <laughs> it sounds like Mrs. Frame would like um, us to pull the efficacy research um, from FAST. I can picture even in my brain where that would be on their website. Um, so I can pull that and share that with you. Um, we can even, Mr. Mayfield, maybe put it in this Friday's notes. Um, and then I, I also heard her asking for um, like districts to us. So I will look and see if I can see that um, in that research. Um, and then also I will keep you all posted on our potential countywide purchase. So, and it's um, did I get that? <laughs> Is that correct, Evelyn? And it sounded like you were interested in this because it will help um, as we develop the LCAP. Is that correct? Yeah, I think I'm thinking in terms as we are adopting and looking through the cycle, um, whatever information that we can get that contextualizes the programs that we're looking at um, is, is, is helpful and it informs my decision. I don't know about anybody else, but it helps to inform my decision yeah, as a board sure. member. So I wanna see, do other board members have an interest in this information? Mr. Buckman does, uh, Ms. Dobler Drew does, mm -hmm. Dr. Eisendrath Rogers, okay. So Dr. Prater, we, we know what we want. Okay, yeah. perfect. Other questions from board members, Mr. Buckman? Yep, first of all, Evelyn, thank you very much. That, that is great insight and question. Um, I think mine's a little easier, I hope. Uh, Rick, is there a timeline for completing? Let me see, is that better? Is there a timeline for completing the work with um, Ms. Blow and, and coming up with a final game plan for the summer? Yeah, you know, well, like I said, mentioned earlier, Mr. Buckman, we have kind of what's happening this summer uh, you right. know, which is obviously more immediacy to the planning and we've got to get hiring and we need to get uh, 
information in parents' hands. We have uh, we postponed our parent-teacher conferences for elementary until the last week before spring break, and we hope to have a detailed flyer for parents and teachers uh, for that week, uh, which is a week from Monday, I believe. Okay. And um, that way, you know, what teachers typically do is then recruit uh, families uh, for summer learning. So we have the immediacy of this summer. Uh, and then her work is she's working with a community group, a group of teachers, uh, community members, uh, of course, district staff on the long term planning. And I don't have that in front of me exactly what that uh, timeline is, but I can certainly get it to you. Thanks, uh, Chris. I know. Other questions from board members? Uh, Mrs. Sheffer. Yes, thank you. I have a question about the fast bridges and, and that is the assessment. And is that, um, I have two questions. One is the assessment given in a group so it can be given to a classroom of students at the same time, or is it individually? It depends on the grade level. So assessment in kindergarten and first grade is more developmentally appropriate when you're sitting next to them asking the question in a one-on-one -on -one setting. Um, and then as you move up the grade levels in FastBridge, it becomes all online. So there's a part of the second grade language arts where you listen to the student read to take a fluency measure of like how fast they're reading. Um, and that's a three minute assessment done one on one and then the rest is done online. But then after that, it's all online and it can be done in a group setting or a small group setting. The progress monitoring tools um, that you do like on a weekly or biweekly basis are usually done more one on one um, just because of the nature of you're in an intervention group assessing. But um, but yeah, it just depends. So then with those, with the one-on-one, -on -one, especially at the younger levels, those that take a little longer, would there be a sub cost involved in that if several were done in a day or are those done on an ongoing basis? I think- And then, and then I have a, one last follow-up. Yeah, um, at this point, we are really um, just kind of testing the waters on that kinder and first grade assessments. We have left our benchmark assessment system, the, the typical reading assessment that we do. Um, teachers love it so much and find it so useful. And that's part of why um, Michelle Cass and Chelsea Smiley have been out giving the other kinder and first grade one from FastBridge to see how useful that is for teachers to try to compare before we make any kind of shift there. Um, it's definitely faster than a benchmark assessment system assessment. Um, a fast bridge assessment is five minutes for reading and five minutes for math. And a BAS, they call it, could take 15 minutes, 20 minutes, longer if you can't get the kid in the right book or they keep going up levels, right? So we're, we're playing with that um, and the primary, yeah. Okay. And then the feedback, is that provided to the student one on one, or is the feedback more for the teacher's use to know when in in uh, teaching? It's it's primarily for the teacher. Um, you know, there's some teachers that choose to share some of that information with students, like for goal setting or things like, hey, you know, you're at this estimated reading level, but it's really teacher oriented for them to make instructional decisions. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, other questions from board members? Okay, let's, sorry, Dr. Eisendrath. Um, this is from Mr. Mayfield, actually. And um, I apologize in advance because it's gonna sound frivolous compared to everything else we've been talking about and the importance of the, the work that uh, we're doing with our, our youngsters. But I, I just need to share with you and maybe with board members as well that I get calls from despondent parents whose um, children have been planning since they were in second grade and uh, to uh, which college they were gonna be applying to. And, and what they're, I think we're finding out right now is that so many of these students are experiencing the, the loss of um, 
the traction that they perhaps had in terms of uh, the classes they're taking and the grades that they're getting and the, how that's going to impact their uh, applications to the universities that they've been dreaming of their entire lives. Um, so my question <laughs> has to do with, is there a way that we can reach out to these same students because they are, you know, they're experiencing the loss of the traction of the grades that they're getting and the and the test scores that they're going to get as a result of this do you know of anything mr mayfield that's a, available uh, to these parents and to these students or any information or that we could share with them um and educate ourselves about how we can help these students because they're they're truly in pain it's a very uh it's really tragic for this yeah. this particular grade of students I would say without a doubt, sites are working with their students to, you know, try and support whatever their academic needs are, whether they're the most vulnerable and needy or whether those, like you say, are just about on the cusp of uh, acceptance into college and struggling with, you know, all the details of that. Uh, in my conversations with our secondary sites, you know, they are absolutely, you know, talking to their students and families about uh, you know, things that can be done in ways that we can support, um, you know, those kids moving forward. As you saw on, on one of the first slides, you know, right at the top of the list is our 12th graders uh, and graduation. And knowing that, you know, we don't have a lot of time. We have some time with first graders uh, to make up some of that learning. And we have some interventions that we can do. But with our uh, 12th graders and, and even 11th graders, uh, it's just critical that we get to those kids now. And so in our conversations with secondary schools, that's absolutely happening. Uh, and we're looking at all the students and where they're at in terms of graduation and being ready to move on. So is there such a thing as a credit recovery for a student who would normally have gotten a, an A in this course, but now they're getting a C or a D and it's gonna, they believe, the student believes that this is gonna impact upon their acceptance. Mm -hmm. uh, is that something that we can actually help with or is, is that out of our purview, yeah. do you feel like? No, no, we actually can. Uh, students can elect to take, there's a limit of how many courses that they can get a grade or credit recovery, uh, you know, because we don't want students, if a student has to take 10 or 15 different courses over again, then there's obviously some other intervention that that student needs. Uh, but in, in a case like you're explaining, that's probably a student who has not taken advantage of credit or grade recovery before. And those things certainly would be available uh, to students, uh, including over the summer. But they would be available now during the regular uh, session as well. Excellent, thank you. I'll try to help get the word out about that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, let's go to the public to see if there's anybody from the public that would like to comment on this item. We have no one. Um, now, We've gone about two and a half hours. Ordinarily, I would say that we would take a break, a short break. However, I, I do see that we have one, one more item uh, that will be an action item. And then we have several, um, we have several first readings of purport, proposed board policies. So my question to Dr. Prater or somebody is, um, how long do you think Mr. Kolish's presentation will take um, because if it, if, if it seems like it'll take about 15 or 20 minutes, then I think we should take a break. Otherwise, I think we can just plow forward and, and be finished fairly shortly. So I'm just curious yeah, if somebody I, can give I, me an idea about that. As someone who had gotten up and used the restroom while we were, you were presenting, I feel a little bit guilty saying, <laughs> I'm perfectly fine. We could work this out. Um, but Mr. Yeah, the, the, the next presentation is relatively short and, and then it's a, a quick ride, but I think a break would be in order if. Okay, so it's 7.30 right now. Let's take a five minute break. We will reconvene at 7.35.
but I think we're set. So I'm assuming Mrs. Dobler Drew will join us. Um, let's, we're going to resume, assuming we're ready. So again, I, I think what I'd like to ask is if there's anybody who needs translation, you would go ahead and raise your hand and let us know. That would be helpful. Okay. So our next item is item 8.03, district-wide website renovation. And this will be presented by Mr. Kolish. Welcome. Hey, thanks for having me. And it's good to use the podium for once here. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, everybody, I'm uh, Jeremy Kellish. I'm usually the voice that you've all heard from Zoom behind the screen. So this is half my face, you know, the rest is masked up. So it's good to finally come out from behind the scenes and see all of you and, and be here today. So today we're gonna quickly talk about just uh, redesigning our website. Our website, uh, in general, websites need to get refreshed every so many years. They get a little outdated, they get aged. And what I like to say is entropy happens where everything starts to degrade because we start adding stuff to the, the website, but we never really start taking it down. So if, you, if you've noticed on our website in general, especially our district website, it's, it's kind of cluttered with a lot of information. True. In addition to that, when COVID hit, it, it became very hard because there's so much clutter to get the, the, the COVID information right out there in front of people. So it brought, back, it brought up some of the weaknesses within our design in general. So um, this is a good time to talk about it. We've uh, transitioned from Aries and we've settled that. So what's the next project to innovate? And that's, it's, we're looking at our website. So one of the other challenges that we faced is the back end, right? The, con the, the content management system is really kind of clunky. It, it worked well when it did, but it's really clunky. And a lot of times you guys have to understand that when a site wants to up their website, update their website, they really have to reach out to IS and T and it's our network engineers, our network technicians that have to assist them. So that's pulling our staff out of the field and working on technical issues really to update our website. And that's, you know, as you can understand, it's not a good use of IS and T technician time and whatnot, but we're always willing to help out when necessary. So one of our objectives was let's find this time, let's find a, let's look for a website developer that was K-12 centric. Somebody that worked with a lot of school districts that understood school districts that understood the messaging and the design, what parents, the community and students all were looking for. And at the same time, understanding our issues and what, what we are looking for. For example, having understanding that we have to have ADA requirements and getting audited for that, you know? And maybe providing some value add that a standard website developer wouldn't have that somebody who's K-12 centric would. So we really wanted to find a, web, a website developer that gave that, that fresh look and feel, you know, that, that look and feel that, you know, San Luis Coastal is a top tier school district that we say we are. Let's, let's present that on a website. And let's get that look out there. You know, uh, we also wanted to find somebody who had a content management system or CMS that was user-friendly, that a site secretary at, you know, with a little bit of training, we could provide that training and they could be off to the races updating their site um, without having to use ISNT resources to really get their, their message out there. So, and then um, last but not least, we also wanted a website CMS that was flexible enough, but also had the appropriate structure in place that we could protect the image of San Luis Coastal. As you understand, sometimes if we provide too much flexibility, you get a lot within the website and that's where your entropy and your inconsistencies happen within your website, your website design. So we have our why, we have our objectives. So now we got to find the who. So we reached out to a company called Foxbrite for a proposal. We've reached out to a company called Final Site for a proposal. We reached out to our local uh, website designer that we've had for a while. That would be uh, Liftoff Digital, formerly iTech. And then at the same time, we, lift, uh, we reached out to Blue Fountain Media, but they declined to provide a proposal because our timeline was too tight for them. So we received three proposals. We looked at them. We looked at all the different pluses and minuses of these uh, proposals and, and what they could provide. 
And we decided that we were going to go with Final Sight. We felt that Final Sight, first and foremost, provided the K-12 centric look and feel that we truly wanted. Ju not just from our eyes, but from, uh, from the eyes of, if you're a parent, what would you wanna see from this top tier like website and this top tier district? And at the same time, they, they automatically maintain that ADA compliance so that we can make sure that we're, we're staying in line. And at the same time, we also figured out and found out on accident, which is another value add, is that they can integrate with our SIS. And I know in the slide deck, it says that it integrates with PowerSchool, but we reached out to them and they integrate with Aries as well. So just imagine what we could do. We could, we could potentially provide you know, metrics right on our dashboard in real time. What's our graduation rate at San Luis Coastal? I don't know what you would want to provide out there, but there are opportunities to kind of brag about what we do at the district, you know, and put it right out there. And so, and um, we also looked at it that the, they integrate with Google. We are a Google institution, you know, we use, um, Gmail and whatnot as well. So they integrate with Google, which makes it easier for us to manage and maintain sign-ins and logins. So when somebody is offboarded outside out of the district that we know when their account's disabled that they can no longer update our website. We looked at the uh, content management system and we found that it was you know very easy to use with very little training, which meant that we would not have to always engage ISNT, especially our high-end resources, you know, our network engineers and technicians to be able to update the website. And, and la a few other uh, great examples are they have a mobile app. And so families can install the mobile app right on their uh, phone and they can receive push notifications when we update or we send out communication. And when it comes to training, I know training is a very, very important thing. Uh, we do a lot of training here and they have unlimited training through their self-guided learning management system, as well as when we're implementing the project, their project manager works with us to provide the training as well, hands-on. So I know like that security is a big concern, especially since there's a lot of, um, well, just with Microsoft and solar winds in the news lately. And so mainly the, the main thing that's really nice about this is the Google integration for login for us. So that's what I have right now. Uh, if anybody has any questions, let me know. I'm, I'm right here, so I'll open it up. And what I believe what you're asking for this evening, this is an action item and you're asking yes. for the uh, board to approve the, the expenditure of funds to redo our, our, our website. And actually it sounds like some of our communications period. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Great. Uh, are there any board member questions about this presentation? Mr. Buckman? Yep. Um, you answer a lot of my questions. I appreciate that. Um, I still, I noticed something in their information. It looked like the district would be, the PTAs and the boosters would be able to use this actually like almost like a fundraiser. They yes, uh, they can use the website to activate fundraisers and take donations of that sort as well. So yes, you can use it for that. Thank you, Mr. Buckman. Other questions, Mrs. Uh, Sheffer, and then I think that's it for now. Mrs. Sheffer. Jeremy, thank you. And um, just because I like to give a public shout out whenever I can, <laughs> none of this would be happening with, that you're seeing right now without Jeremy and his department. So, um, but I would like to ask you, you indicated that, um, that questions can be answered through a self-guided management training. And my question, Jeremy, is, how hard is it if someone is really struggling to actually get to speak with a human being as someone who occasionally just wants to talk to a human being? Would that, is that possible through this uh, company or would they turn to IS&T or what would happen if someone is really just having a hard time navigating uh, the website or wanting to, to maneuver it somehow? 
A uh, great question. Right. And it will feedback. Um, great question. And the answer to that is we also are paying, we are also gonna get the maintenance with the website as well. So they can reach out to final site themselves and be guided and help through updating their website. And to answer the, I guess the first part of your question too is how easy it is to get a hold of somebody in a human contact way. Uh, Mandy uh, worked with me on this as well. And she reached out to a lot of final sites customers to ask that question, you know, how is their customer service? It's one thing to be sold a shiny object, but it's another thing to, to really be served. And she said that the feedback they got is that they're wonderful. They're great to work with and they're easy to get a hold of. And she got nothing but positive reviews from reaching out to other school districts. Okay, yeah, that's that's really that's really mm -hmm. important. All right, thank you. And Chris, and thank you for the shout out, Mr. Buckman. Jeremy, I, I don't think you mentioned this. And so, as I was reading the information, there was a uh, there was a little scary stuff in there. So there's, and I may not understand how it works. So. Um, you can link and have Facebook automatically download. You can have Twitter automatically download. And we know that there's been a lot of stuff going on with those two services. Is there ability to just sort of say no to that service? To answer your question quickly? Yeah. Yes. Okay, good, thanks. Yeah, you, you don't have to turn that on. Yeah. Other questions from board members? Well, I just I just want to say um, if the board approves this, I, I'll be excited because I do I do find our website a little dated, um, a little clunky to look through. Um, when I look at websites from other school districts, um, many of them are are much more modern looking. I, I guess I would say, um, Mrs. Frame. Oh no, I was just going to comment, Jeremy. When we had that, I, I appreciate the time you took with me today, answering my questions. But um, it's that um, that view that you talked to me about. It's you know who who are, who is who is this site for? It's mm -hmm. really kind of for our parents and our families. And and I know in as great as 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 this department is, there have been times when parents. I think it's easy to find something, or and and because of COVID and and the amount of information we're having to put on the site now, they're having a hard time you know finding it. So whatever we can do to kind of streamline that through this process would be, I think, welcome for parents and things like that. So I appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anybody else from the board? Okay, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring it back to the public. This is an action item to see if there is anyone from the public that would like to speak to this item. Seeing no one, I'll bring it back to the board. Um, this is an action item. So would someone like to make a motion to uh, approve the district-wide website renovation. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to do that, Chris. Motion by Mrs. Buckman, Ms. Ms. Sorry, <laughs> Mr. Buckman, second by Mrs. Frame. Is there any further discussion from the board? I just, I'd just like to also point out that, that I didn't realize Mandy was involved in this. I think that that's such a great use of somebody that's our, our upfront person for the whole community, always goes right through there. So thanks, Mandy. Okay, so, um, Mr. Buckman, you're making a motion to approve item 8.03, is that correct? Yes, sir. Perfect. Mr. Buckman? Yes. Frame? Yes. Ms. Dobler-Drew? Yes. I, <laughs> thank you. Uh, Dr. Eisendrath Rogers? Mrs. Roger? Yes. to district records, uh, Mrs. McGrath. Yes, thank you. Um, tonight we have, sorry, I didn't have that pulled up. District records was the first one, correct? Uh, District-wide um, reversions to, yes, access to district records, first reading. Thank you. Yes, tonight we have uh, this first board policy. This is a first reading on this one. You'll notice that it has gone through 
and our process of directors looking at it as well as the subcommittee. In the district records, it talks about access through electronic means. The subcommittee, I think, wisely tries to keep that uh, wording just electronic so that it, um, as electronics are modernized, then the uh, wording doesn't have to be changed every time. Um, it talks about personal equipment as well as um, some needed updates to codes. So this is first reading on this one. I would recommend bringing it back for a second. Okay, is there anybody from the board that has a question? Is there anybody from the, seeing anyone, is there anybody from the public that would like to address this on this item? Seeing no one, uh, this, I'm assuming that the board wants to bring this back for a second reading, is that correct? Not everybody's preference? Okay, good, we'll bring this back for a second reading. Let's move on to item 8.05, proposed revisions to board policy 5144.1, suspension and expulsion due process. Mr. Yes. yes. Mr. Unger, maybe I'm reading the agenda wrong, but I, I think this is the second reading. I think they usually come to us as a, a, within the consent agenda. We do have some under first reading, and then there okay. are some that are listed under second reading Got today. It. We I'm do sorry. have I'm on the wrong listed item. in both. Thank you very much. You bet. Um, Mrs. McGrath. So suspension and expulsion, yes, due process. This is board policy 5144.1. You'll see some um, ed code updates and um, went through the same process as well. You'll notice on the third page, some of the really specific information was suggested uh, to be moved to the AR, and you will see some code updates as well. This is a first reading on this policy, so I would recommend this coming back for a second as well. Is there anybody from the board that has questions on this one? Is the, I, I'd like to go to the public. Is there anyone from the public that would like to address this on this item? Okay, seeing no one, um, I'll bring it back to the board to see if it's the board's consensus to uh, bring this back for a second reading. Is everybody good with that? Everybody looks good with that. Okay, we'll bring this back for a second reading. Move on to item 8.06, proposed revisions to board policy 5145.3, non-discrimination and harassment. This is also a first reading, Mrs. McGrath. Great, thank you. You will see some um, additions here. It's a legal requirement that this um, information be posted, hopefully on our uh, new modernized website it would be awesome. Um, next, you'll see that uh, it talks about training needs. Um, I did hear some questions from board members about the word regular that that doesn't um, you know clearly define a timeline. So um, if, if we want to change that maybe to annual, to add some more definition there, I would leave that up to you to decide if, uh, if you would like for me to define that a little further. Um, I think on that one, we, the subcommittee, we were thinking to leave it a little open um, in order to uh, be able to adjust, but also I could see some benefit to defining it to something like annual. So um, up to you if, if anyone would like that adjustment and um, that is it for that one. Well, I think what, I, what I'd like to hear maybe is from the subcommittee and hmm. see if they have any comments about this or any preferences. Buckman or Mrs. Sheffer, do you have anything you'd like to add? Mrs. Sheffer? Yeah, I would just say that, you know, my experience with the subcommittee is we, is we you know, take a look at it, but then that's why we bring it back to the board. It is a board decision. So if they're people on the board who would, if there's a majority of people would like to see um, more language in there, then it should be taken under consideration by the entire board. Um, Mrs. Frame? Yeah, um, uh, I, I would refer also back to our um, subcommittee there. Um, two, um, one of the things I was um, looking at was that um, regular training and the reason why um, it caught my attention was because um, there's a real um, specific um, requirement of employees that um, when, a, when they see some kind of a harassment that a district employees mm -hmm. must intervene immediately when they see intimidation, harassment, bullying, or discrimination. So it seems like that, um, that burden of doing an annual notification would really kind of bring that home to us that that's something that we um, would want to do. And the other thing that I was, you know, wondering, I'm going to put this out to um, um, my colleagues is that the first sentence says the governing board 
desires to provide a safe school environment that allows all students equal access and opportunities. I'm wondering, because of our focus on equity, would that be equitable access? Oh, or would we leave equal access? It, it, those are just the, the two things I was, um, so anybody else wanna? Actually, if, if the board is interested, I, I would think that it would be equal and equitable because those are referred to two different things. Mm -hmm. That's good. So my, my, my suggestion might be thinking about that, that we add equal and equitable access. That'd be something the board would have an interest in. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Yes. Ellen, how would you feel about that? That's, that's fine. That's, okay. You know, we're, we're just a subcommittee. It is the will of the oh, board. Yeah. You know? no, so, I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to do is I, get I don't a want to give us more, more, uh, you know, more uh, responsibility than we have. We just, you know, it's the board that, that make as a whole that has the well, that's, power. That's, that's, yeah, that's what I'm trying to do is get a sense from all of, from everybody about whether to add equitable. So would that be something you would support? Yes, I think that's fine. Okay, Marilyn? Yeah, I, it's, it's fine with me. They are two different things. I'm wondering, are they... No, I think it's fine with me. They go together. Mm -hmm. I, saw, I saw Eve shake her head yes. Mm -hmm. So um, I say we bring this back for a second reading and then the, quite the other adding equitable in that second line. And then the other question for the board is, do we want to be more specific about the training? Um, actually, Mrs. Frame, your comment sort of resonates with me because we do have required annual trainings for our employees, uh -huh. particularly regarding sexual harassment and, and things like that. So I would support uh, changing regular to annual, to at least annual or something. How does the rest of the board feel about that? Mm -hmm. Annual? Yeah. Buckman, how do you feel? Yeah, I, I just, I, as I understand the, the 5,000s uh, re, refer to students. So I think that this would refer to training and information right on the scope of students training. And I know, am I misreading that? But it talks about employees. Kim? You're correct that it is a, a student policy in right. the 5,000s. So, um, and so I do think it talks about um, shall regularly review the implementation of it mm -hmm. as well and take action to remove any. Um, so I do think we could look at the um, student information that is given out to students, which would be in the annual, annual notification. notification terms, right? um, and, and then um, I do think that it could be a staff training would be a benefit as well. So I'm, I'm going to actually recommend, given what Mr. Buckman said, that this is more st student-centered. Right. Maybe, sorry, sorry, subcommittee, that, that we refer this back to the subcommittee um, to see, just to get their sense of what this would relate to with students. I was thinking more along the lines of staff. Um, yeah, so. Uh, and Mr. Unger, if I yeah. may. Um, of course. You know, it, I was going to ask the question, you know, this seems to be getting, you know, slightly a little bit muddled up here is, yeah. is um, if the board is seeming to indicate that trustees should have some sort of training, because this is something we've, it's my understanding, spoken with our attorneys about before and trustees are not mandated reporters and cannot, are not required to participate in trainings. And so if, that, if, if that, that's a different area of, um, that would be more in the board bylaws, it would be a different area of all this and would require a separate discussion um, it would be my understanding. Yeah, I was, yeah, I, I was thinking that, the, I, I was thinking this related to our school staff um, rather than students. And yeah, so and the, my, my, I guess my question is, if it relates to students, is it, is it more appropriate to say regular than annual, as opposed to staff, which I would, 
which we already have the annual requirements. Um, and Mr. Unger, if I could just add in that we could add the um, and the equitable to the beginning. We right. could also add it to the annual um, information to students because of our annual notification that goes out. And that could make those two adjustments that would work for students. How does everybody feel about that? It's, uh, I think it's good. I, I, I might suggest, Kim, if I can, do you want to take a vote on, I, I might suggest that we shall provide Let's see, the superintendent or designee shall provide at least annual training or at a minimum annual training so that we do define it a little bit, but that still allows the superintendent some leeway to do it more often. I, I, I don't know. Totally fine. How, do, mm -hmm. how does the rest of the board feel about that? Carolyn, you're looking like you're not sure. I think if we if we say just annual training, I think that should be adequate. Or annual. But I, think I think it's reasonable because you can annual, always do more. But I think you're talking about annual review, because you're what you're proposing is that this go that that an, an annual review could include uh, inclusion in the, um, the the notification that goes out every year. Mm -hmm. Which I think could be defined as uh, distributing information and even okay. training as you put that out there. So I would be comfortable with it saying um, annual because I think you can always go above and beyond. Okay, everybody good with that? Okay, it looks like everybody's good with that. Might I suggest that, that when we bring this back, in, um, we think about whether we want to have it be in the consent agenda or not, or whether we want to okay. actually have it on the regular agenda since we've got so much discussion about Sounds it. Sounds good. Um, I have one. I have one more very brief question. I just wanted yes. to. I wanted. I'd like to touch base with um, Evelyn, with Mrs. Frame, because it seems that maybe you raised some of this. Does this ad adequately address your concerns? Uh, absolutely. I was really kind of wanting to engage, you know, colleagues in kind of what their what their view is. Um, so I kind of see it as more of kind of a consensus, and if this is really kind of the intent of. And we can clarify the policy policy and make it a little bit clearer. So absolutely, um, but again, it's really uh, the board as a, as a whole. So, thank you, Ms. Sheffer. Thank you. Okay. So I think we've made our decision. Um, let's move on to number eight point. Oh wait, did we go to the public on this? Is there anybody? There is no one from the public that would like to address the board on this item. Uh, 8.07 proposed revisions to board policy 6143 courses of study. Courses of study, yes. So um, this policy has quite a few uh, legal updates. You can see here in red talking about a uh, sequence of courses and aligned sequence of courses that really provides uh, for a great use of instructional time. You can see that it talks about um, our work uh, with articulating courses with uh, other institutions, which we have talked about before, some of our great co um, collaborative partners there, um, talks about offering students in seventh through 12th uh, a course of study and talks about, you know, preparing them for college university, which we've made great strides in having our courses be uh, A to G compliant. So um, there's are quite a few red legal changes here. Your board subcommittee did uh, take a great look at this and um, again, would recommend a second reading. Pretty good with that. Frank. Yes, I, um, there, I was just wondering if um, for the, um, where, where it re refers to um, the district's course of study shall provide students with opportunities to attain skills, knowledge, and abilities. Would it be, prudent to put the word equitable before opportunities or is that and I'm just I think I was reading it with with kind of that lens of, of where our, our priority is but I'm would would ask um, my colleagues what what their thinking is on that this was really the only thing I saw on that so where where would that be in the it's in um, the second sentence of that the district's course of study shall provide students with it says opportunities. And so if we put equitable opportunities to attain the skills, knowledge, and abilities. But How does the board feel about that? Suggestion to add uh, equitable 
after uh, with equitable students with equitable opportunities, that would be the second sentence in the first paragraph of this board policy. I'm good. Brian? Make it yes. This is Roger. How do you feel about adding equitable in that sentence? I, 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 well, it's a it's a district focus in so many areas, but I, I just have a little gut feeling that if we start using it all the time, it loses its impact and uh, and kind of meaning. Uh, I I am fine without it, but I will support adding it if that's the will of the board. So Shepard, do you have a feeling on this? I would tend to agree with Mrs. Roger. I just don't really see that it adds anything here, but I will remain neutral. Um, it's not it's not a hill I'm willing to fight on, but I I certainly don't think it's necessary. First, Mrs. Dr. Drew, how do you feel about that? Yeah, I'm neutral on it too. Either way. So I guess I get to to break the tie. Well. Um, <laughs> Yeah, this, well, this, I, this is Eisendrath, Dr. Eisendrath Roger. What? Sorry, what? You didn't, you didn't see a Catherine had an opinion. You know what? She 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 shook her head. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, just, I saw Mr. Buck and like her side to side. Yes or no? <laughs> if, so if I can, I didn't get. So I think because it's a concept that's lacking in so many places um, within the district and within our framework, and we're working so hard to to capture it. I don't, I, I don't have a problem at all putting it in, in in as many places as we can as a reminder to ourselves. Um, and I'd also note that this, this board policy hasn't been updated since 2003. So mm -hmm. it's not, it, I, don't, I don't think it's bad. So I'm in favor of including it. Okay. So um, I'm gonna be in favor, I'm gonna say I'm in favor of including it as well. And I think, I think you had shaken your head before. Okay. <laughs> All right. What was that? So, uh, is she cold? Mrs. McGrath, I think you have that. And Great. we'll bring this back. I will add equitable. No problem. Yeah, we'll bring this back for a second reading. Hold on here. Okay. Uh, 8.08. Proposed revisions. Oh, we go to the public on this. I'm sorry. Anybody there? Dawson? Good. Uh, 8.08. Proposed revisions to board policy 6154. Homework, makeup work. First reading. Thank you. Quite a few uh, revisions to this one as well. It does talk about um, that a superintendent or designee shall collaborate with school administrators and teachers uh, to regularly review guidelines, which I think is a great idea. I love the subcommittee's addition of just acknowledging that students are involved in a range of activities and also many responsibilities and uh, with those um, things should be considered when assigning homework. It also talks about communicating homework expectations to students as well as their parents and guardians. So this is a first reading here. Would recommend this coming back for a second reading. And, and I actually have a question about this. Um, I believe there's a, there are a couple of places in here where it talks about things being turned in, I believe, within a reasonable time, isn't that the? Mm -hmm. And and my question is, what is a reasonable time? Um, and and I'm this. It may be more of an AR type issue, but um, one teacher's reasonable time might not be another teacher's reasonable time, uh, and it might be confusing to students and parents. So I'd like to get some sense on on what that might mean. Mm -hmm. I think you make a great point. A reasonable time on a uh, extensive essay is probably really different than, uh, you know, first graders right. reasonable time for something. Um, although I think, you know, they're probably putting reasonable time for that purpose to allow for some flexibility um, in something that usually reasonable time is defined as something that uh, the general public would agree that it, uh, you know, is within a reasonable amount of time. I understand your concern that it is gray. Yeah, it, it might be something to clarify in an administrative regulation because, again, you know, I, I, I could see someone, um, someone being upset that, that one teacher gave more leeway than another one, and it could actually put pressure on teachers, you know, to um, extend things when they really didn't want to. So I think if, if I could, when you 
bring this back for a second reading. Uh, I'd like some just clarification on that, if that would be accessible. And yeah, Mrs. Sheffer, and then Mr. Buffer. Yeah, I, you know, as I recall, this was discussed in our subcommittee, and it was determined an AR would be the place for it, that this does not, we'd have to go level by level and subject by subject to determine what is reasonable, and that is going down too deep in the weeds. Um, so it, it was my understanding, and Mrs. McGrath and Mr. Buckman can correct me if I am not re recalling correctly, but we did discuss that this would be uh, further defined uh, in more detail in the AR. Okay, if I, and I, I just want to follow up on what Ellen's saying. I think this is a real good example of what we as a committee and, and, and maybe the board as well, BPs, big and broad, and it's the board's policy, and then we so, and then this is something that AR that staff determines, and and they're the experts. So right. lots of philosophy, and then the need to implement. And so right. this is, you know, we we've been taking a lot of stuff out of board policies and giving it back. Good example of of that di differentiation. Perfect. As you know, like I said, I'm I was just a little concerned about some confusion, um, and I'm glad to hear that that you all discussed it and that. You came to consensus on placing it in the administrative regulations, which I think is probably appropriate for it. Perfect. Um, is there anybody from the public that would like to address this? Being no one, uh, any other board discussion? We now will go to our action consent agenda. Please let me know if you would like uh, something pulled. 9.01, acceptance of donations. 9.02, approval of foreign exchange organizations. 9.03, approval of certificated and classified personnel items. 9.04, disposal of surplus. 9.05, approval of furniture and equipment requests. 9.06, proposed revisions to board policy 0430 Comprehensive Local Plan for Special Education, second reading. 9.07 Proposed Revisions to Board Policy 4113 Assignment, second reading. 9.08 Proposed Revisions to Board Policy 5116.1 Interdistrict Open Enrollment, second reading. 9.09 9 Proposed Revisions to Board Policy 5141.5, mental health, second reading. And 9.10, proposed revisions to board policy 6146.1, high school graduation requirements, second Poll, reading. please. Uh, so poll 9.01, 9.1, who, who pulled that, please? I did. Okay, thank you. Hold on just a second, Marilyn. Okay, so we're pulling 9.10, perfect. Okay, um, I'm just going to go to the public real quick to see if anybody has any comment about the action consent agenda. I'm not seeing anyone, so I'd like to take a motion to approve items 9.01 to 9.09. .09. Mrs. Frame? Yes, someone? I'll make a motion to um, move that we um, accept nine point action consent items 9.01 to 9.09. .09. I'll second. That was that was you, Marilyn. I'm sorry. Yeah, that was me. Okay, thank you. Hold on. Okay. Any further discussion? All right. Uh, Evelyn. Yes. Marilyn. Yes. Uh, Mrs. Sheffer. Yes. Dr. Eisendrath Rogers. Mr. Buckman. Mrs. Dobler Drew? Yes. And I'm a yes. Motion carries seven to zero. Uh, back to you, Mrs. Roger, with item 9.10. Thank you. I don't have the um, item open in front of me. I'm hoping Mrs. McGrath can help me out with this. I discussed with her earlier today um, because I, I have a concern that when we're discussing the credit requirements for graduation, the way it currently, the way it reads in this policy, 
um, if adopted, it, it could appear that the number of credits required for graduation at San Luis Obispo High School, which has been adjusted for this year only because we are, um, we have switched due to COVID, we've switched to a semester system. It could be construed or could be read that that's an ongoing change to the credit requirements and that um, I wouldn't want because that is something that the teachers vote on. I wouldn't want anyone to um, be confused and or uh, and believe that we were um, setting up to half slow high school on a semester system. So I I wanted it to read something like you know for this year only or I don't know. Is are you under are you all understanding what I'm saying? Yes, yeah, so, and to Ms. Rogers' um, suggestion, I did go ahead and um, put a proposed uh, just addition of only. Um, previously, it said um, switch from trimester to semester for the 2020-2021 school year. So I just added only and just added um, if it reverted back, then the credits would revert back as well. So um, I believe that would be addressed. That's and perfect. That's perfect for me. I don't know how my colleagues feel. Yeah, that works for me. Everybody okay with it, so, Mrs. Mrs. Schiffer? Yeah, I, sorry. Um, the only thing I would I would question then um, is wondering. It says if it reverts back, if then if it should say when it reverts back. It should. To further, because now it sounds as though, I mean, I I would say now it sounds as though it may not. And again, um, it may not because it is up to a staff vote and we the staff vote has not been brought forward yet. So it is actually, uh, in my mind was an if since okay. it's uh, determined by vote. But isn't, but because it's, I guess it's six of one and half a dozen of the other then I'm getting tired um, because then, so if we say if that's the same thing, and it's like, oh, it may not. And if we say when, then it's the same, you know. So I guess it leaves some ambiguity no matter what we do. I mean, I think I think Mrs. Rogers' initial concern is is completely addressed by indicating the 2020-2021 school year only. But then um, then the next sentence sounds you know, I guess no matter what we do, it will it will add a little ambiguity in there. So, so, um, are you, Mrs. Shepherd? Are you okay with this? Yeah, I mean, I, I I suppose you know it's I don't know how to make it um, clear. I mean, I, I I guess what I'm ending up with is either way, it sounds a little up in the air. If or when, if when, you know, um, we don't know. They're both. It's a it's a voting. It's something that the staff, the teachers vote on, any regardless. So I guess it could be either either word. I see, Dr. Prater. It looks like you have a comment about this. Yeah, you know, in my mind, in my mind, what's written is appropriate because in the contract, while the teachers do get to vote. The board holds the ultimate decision. Um, and so because the circumstances of COVID and where we're going continues to be fluid, I think the way it was written, um, the way it is written, I think captures it. Um, as we'll continue to look at what next year looks like. And um, certainly, you know, the, the staffs are voting on their schedules um, as we speak and in the next couple of weeks. Uh, however, as we get closer to planning out next year and bringing in the spring, bringing that ultimately for that that vote for the board's consideration, it remains the board's ultimate call in the contract. Yes, it does. Okay, I see that we do have, it looks like we have a public comment from Mrs. Egan. Um, Lena, go ahead and when you start your three minutes, which will begin. Thanks. Um, it's just a quick comment that it's it's 250 credits 
for all the kids in ninth, 10th, 11th and, and 12th grade to graduate because this year um, we waived 15, essentially 15 credit hours uh, because we went to the semester system versus trimester. But I fear that once we revert um, back to trimester, it's still 250 for all of these grades carrying forward um, because so it's not necessarily when we revert back to trimester that it automatically switches to 265 because um, the ninth graders won't be able to get to 265 by, by their uh, fourth year. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's so a good clarification. Yeah, I like that, Lena. It's a great point. Maybe uh, just um, maybe to Ellen's point earlier, to Marilyn's original point was just adding that word only would probably resolve it and just eliminate that second sentence. Um, so can you, would you like to read what your proposed language is or would you like to bring this back at the next meeting? Bring it back? Yeah. Sure, so, happy to. So with the board's consent, we'll just bring this back to the next meeting um, for a further discussion on this. Okay, so that item will be pulled then. Won't address that item. Hold on just a minute. Okay, so um, let's move on to item 10.02. I'm sorry, 10 point, yeah, 10.02, advanced agenda. Does anyone have anything they'd like to put on the advanced agenda? Okay, seeing no one, I'll bring it to item 11.01, .01, reports by board members. Does anyone have a report that they'd like to give? Buckman. Thank you. Um, I, I did spend some time at uh, an elementary school, middle school, and high school um, since they've all opened. And I just want to thank everybody. So much work went into this. And from where I sit, it was flawless. I mean, it just was great. Um, Chris talked a lot about people sitting and the masks. And I was at the um, I was at uh, CL Smith, and I watched the kids change between AM and PM, and they've got one group gets to use the playground for a week and everybody knows what they're doing it was great and the pods were great um the buzz at the schools that just everything felt really up um and i visited slow high um, i got a fairly extensive tour of the theater and the career pathways and also the locker rooms um but i the the theater I just, I don't, we're going to have to beat off the community because they're all going to want to use it. And it's, it's, it's great. And the career pathways, I, I have to tell you what's going on up there is great. But what I envision is that's going to be another place that we might have to beat off the community from asking to use it. It's, it's just ideal. I mean, I could, I envision dads and kids in there fixing up hot rods and welding together. Um, so kudos to everybody. Great opening. Great stuff. Anybody else? And I just, I, I also went to Baywood School last week and just want to thank the staff at Baywood School for welcoming me and sharing with me what the great things that they're doing. Um, I'm not seeing anyone else who has, I have to double check to make sure. Dr. Eisenbrath Rogers. You... I just uh, wanted to say what a joy it was to uh, come to Laguna the other day and try to and load up my, um, well, I came with the intention of loading up my station wagon with lunch boxes, but um, the work had already been done and it was well on its way, but it was very exciting to see it being uh, loaded up in someone else's car <laughs> to go to the coast. So just wanted to celebrate that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, Mrs. Dobler Drew. I just want to uh, congratulate everybody in the wonderful team effort of launching the school back in the session. And it's really a time to celebrate uh, this accomplishment. I think it's wonderful. Everybody has had a lot of faith in uh, getting it going and very cooperative and creative and just responsible. And so thank everybody. I thank everybody. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, I think that's it. Um, unlike the study session, I think we've got all the items. Um, so we'll adjourn this meeting until I believe March 30th. Is that correct? So we will have three meetings this month. Um, and 
we'll see you all then. Thank you very much. Bye.